Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs Regular City Council meeting of March 9th, 2023 to order. At this time, I want to introduce our student who will be doing our pledge. Her name is Nilo Fornas. She's a fifth grader at Catherine Finchie. She loves animals and wants to be a vet. And last summer, she made jewelry and to sell and donated almost $900 to our animal shelter. So. <laughs> Nilufar, if you want to go up to the mic. You. Right hand of your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we begin our meeting officially, I, I want to recognize uh, Scarlett Fuerte, who works at One Plant Cannabis Dispensary. She's a security guard there, and yesterday she went to work like any other day, except very quickly into her time there, an armed robber came into the dispensary. And Scarlett acted very quickly, and despite this robber firing a warning shot, Scarlett managed to wrestle the gun from her hand, uh, and then this, the, the um, robber did flee. So I was just so impressed, and I was thinking yesterday was International Women's Day, and here is this female security guard who made sure that she and her, the other, the customer and the other employee that were at the cannabis dispensary was safe, and I know that myself and all of the rest of the council were just so impressed with your, with your bravery. So we want to give you this certificate of recognition if you want to come up. <laughs> And the next item is a welcome to our new city manager, Scott Stiles. Scott joins us from Garden Grove and before that from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I will be doing the oath of office for Scott. So I think we're going to do it up here. Madam Mayor, we need a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm skipping the formalities. Please <laughs> conduct a roll call, Madam Clerk. Council Member DeHart. Here. Councilmember Holstich. Here. Councilmember Middleton. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein. Here. Mayor Garner. Here. Five members present. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we can officially <laughs> do everything. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Do we need one for Scott as well? Once it turns green. Perfect. I state your name. I, Scott Stiles. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. 
to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott, do you want to give a few words? Yes, thank you, um, Mayor, uh, members of council. This is uh, a, a very exciting day for me and my family. Uh, I do want to introduce right in the beginning, uh, my wife Kelly is sitting right there in the front row, along with my daughter, Nora, who's 17 years old. We have an older daughter who is uh, a freshman at Chapman University, and she is in class this evening, which is where she should, where she's supposed to be. So uh, we're, we're happy that uh, that took pre precedence over this. Um, I do want to, uh, you know, we're, my whole family's very energized and excited to be, to be here. We've only done a move like this. This is only the second time we've done something like this. And uh, I can tell you from prior experience, it's it's never an easy transition, to, especially to do it alone. So if you have somebody to help with all the logistics, it makes all the difference in the world. So great thanks to uh, my family to be part of this and helping through this transition, which is, which is really important. I do want to uh, uh, greatly thank uh, uh, the mayor and all the members of the city council for this appointment. I'm really humbled and honored uh, that you've entrusted me with this responsibility. It's, um, it is a great responsibility and um, countless challenges, but it's endlessly rewarding when you can make a difference in your community. And for that, I am very, very grateful to all of you for, for your trust in me. So thank you very much. I also want to just very briefly thank uh, all the members of the city staff that have been so helpful to me uh, uh, this week, especially uh, the city attorney sitting next to me and the clerk and our assistant city manager and deputies behind me and uh, our fire chief, our police chief and his uh, family have been particularly uh, uh, helpful in, in reaching out to us and really all of the department directors. We had a first department director meeting on Monday and it was just great to connect with all of them. And I'm really looking forward to being part of the team working with them, and uh, I, I'm just really uh, excited about that. And then finally, uh, I just want to thank the, uh, the community of Palm Springs. Uh, when uh, the city gave me my city-issued cell phone, and I got here Monday morning, and we turned it on to see if it worked, there were 350 messages waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody... And somebody said, welcome to Palm Springs. <laughs> and I think I was working till about 10 o'clock that night because uh, I wanted to answer every single one of them because I didn't want to wake up to any mo that many the next morning. So, um, but I've just had, uh, everybody's been very welcoming uh, from the business community, uh, the neighborhoods, the hoteliers, uh, small businesses, large businesses. It's just been... Uh, I, I've really felt welcomed uh, into this community, and so for that, I just want to uh, say thank you to everyone, and uh, we, looked, we look forward to being uh, just uh, very involved in the community. We're going to live in Palm Springs. We're going to participate in everything we can here and just be part of the community. So I look forward to being out and about, and uh, again, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Greatly Thank appreciated. you. Welcome, Scott. i give you another round of applause. <laughs> and welcome to Kelly and Nora. And, and Nora, it's a 
big deal to come here for your senior year. So we thank you for being on board as well. <laughs> Uh, our next item is acceptance of the agenda. The City Council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on consent calendar items, or request consent calendar items be removed for separate discussion. Do we have any items that a council member or staff would like removed from consent calendar for a separate discussion? Seeing none. I do want to make a note in terms of the agenda that item 3A will be moved to the next meeting. There's uh, some information that's missing that will be presented next time. At this time, I'd like to invite the city attorney to present a report on closed session. Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the public, the City Council met in closed session earlier this afternoon uh, to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda and there was no reportable action. Great, thank you. And do we have a motion to accept the agenda? Motion to accept. Seconded. <clears throat> Thank you. The next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be provided to each speaker. You're asked to please begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you're speaking about. And please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and any general public comment will occur at the end of the meeting. The first, and I'm gonna read a couple of names so if you can be ready, I would appreciate it. Uh, Alejandro Mesa Aguilar, followed by Brian Sanchez. Oh, you, I'm sorry, you just come up right up here to the dais and the microphone will be turned on for you and you have two minutes. <laughs> Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alejandro Mesa Aguilar. I am the Coachella organizer for uh, the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice. Um, and I'm here to talk about the issue of street vending because it's important to our communities. Um, I have some talking points here. And um, I wanted to mention that sidewalk vendors provide food for the working class, the people who sustain your local economy and the hotel, casino, housekeeping, Airbnb, and construction industries. Uh, street vendors also feed at any income level and bridge the gap in classes. They provide nourishing uh, meals for people who leisurely bike and provide a safe space for the community. Um, street vending also provides people the opportunity to work as their own boss and feed workers of the service industry. Uh, the solution to ensure the well-being and assurance of um, workers' rights can start at the smallest level, uh, which would be street vending. Um, especially by enacting proactive policy that protects street vendors rather than um, punishes or limits them. Um, the issue of umbrellas uh, within the ordinance could also be addressed by the sense that umbrellas could uh, be used for um, cooling, uh, especially out here in the desert, since we know heat is an issue uh, for people who are uh, vulnerable, such as the unhoused. Uh, they could provide a safe space to briefly uh, cool down, considering uh, you know, the issue of the heat here can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, lastly, the extension of hours of operation in regards to like residential areas, uh, sunrise to sunset, provides um, the assurance that vendors could uh, be there for support for the community and to ensure uh, some safety because they are community members first. Um, while they, you know, might sell paletas, uh, fruit, or uh, corn, um, and other culturally significant, oh, sorry. <laughs> You're good, thank you for your comment. The next speaker is Brian Sanchez, followed by Liseth Mendoza. Good evening, council members. Thank you for your time today. My name is Brian Sanchez. I am an organizer here in the Coachella Valley working on behalf of the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice, uh, where we operate in both San Bernardino and Riverside counties. I'd like to speak to you today on the sidewalk vendor ordinance that the city of Palm Springs is currently debating. In 2018, SB 946 was signed into law as the Safe Sidewalk Vending Act. And today, five years later, many municipalities have not yet 
adopted ordinances to address street vending, or at times have even actively penalized street vendors um, since the enacting of SB 946. When Palm Springs City Council first introduced this ordinance, we had many concerns as an organization that is dedicated to ad advocating for the fair treatment of street vendors. We applaud the city for the amendments that were brought up by the Director of Planning Services and believe that this is a step in the right direction. But we urge the city to please include the perspective of Pond Springs street vendors and those that advocate for them in any future discussions regarding the ordinance. These are the people who have witnessed firsthand the experience of street vendors or have lived it and can dispel any preconceived notions or concerns about street vending. One of the concerns that we have heard is that the, is that the tents and signage that can be seen as rather complex are indicative of some larger organized or exploitative operation rather than independent enterprising individuals. As an organizer that is a part of, an, of, of the Inland Coalition that has worked extensively with street vendors, we have rarely, if ever, encountered such an operation before. However, if this is a concern for the city, then it only underscores the importance of not further pushing street vendors into the margins of society with punitive ordinances, but rather bringing them in. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Lisette Mendoza, followed by Juan Espinosa. Uh, good evening. Again, my name is Lisette Mendoza, and I'm the, uh, with the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice. I have organized um, in the last 10 years, and I have actually I was actually assigned to work in the Coachella Valley uh, to support the DACA program for undocumented youth when I first started. And so I know a little bit about implementing policies and, and programs directly with the community that it most impacts first, right? Um, and so I, uh, I want to make sure that we continue to work with the sidewalk vending community here, also known as street vendors. Um, in the last five years, as mentioned uh, before, uh, we, this, this policy has been implemented statewide in one way or another, but we continue to see that instead of respecting the spirit of the, of the si Safe Sidewalk Vending Act, uh, more people find uh, ways to discriminate uh, past discriminatory practices um, that drive out some of these small businesses. And so we want to make sure that we're including them into our local economy and the ecosystem and knowing that they can coexist, that these are micro businesses that we should be open for business to. Um, we want to uh, applaud again some of the changes that were made, but we specified through letters and through other public comments that were submitted in the record uh, to, to really look at those recommendations to go a bit further to ensure that they can use different sidewalks. There's going to probably be a lot of sidewalks that they can't use anyways because of the ADA uh, rules. And so we want to make sure that, that 36 inches is, is the minimum that you require uh, for, for uh, pathway access. And so along with that, don't require life scans. Um, you do not need to require an encroachment permit. And instead, invest in education so that we know which sidewalks are allowed, which parks are accessible, to ensure that we're you know, bringing different types of cultural foods and, and products to this, this economy, and also you know, hopefully supporting the, the future businesses that will invest in brick and mortar, either here in Palm Springs or all throughout the Coachella Valley. I know I spoke to a vendor last night all the way from San Bernardino who is looking to invest here already. So please open those doors for them. Thank you. Thank you. The next, the next speaker is Juan Espinosa. I don't think he's here. He's on his way. Okay, I'll, I'll ask again at the end. The next speaker is Fred Noble, followed by Steve Wilcox. Madam Mayor, members of the council, Fred Noble, uh, President of Wintech Energy. Uh, item 3B. Uh, by and large, the staff report frames the issues and, and shows a path to grant the request. Uh, I do note you have reserved jurisdiction to uh, uh, amend the ordinance as necessary on a case-by-case -case basis, although in my reading of the ordinance it doesn't require that. What we're talking about here is a uh, way to commem commemorate the fact that commercial wind energy was pioneered here and made to work in Palm Springs. This is the birthplace of an industry that went around the world. Uh, it was done here beginning 40 years ago. The very first Carter windmill that was installed in 1982. 
when it was uh, made obsolete and replaced, I put it in storage and I've had it ever since. We now want to bring it out of storage, restore it, put it back into operation, and install it together with uh, structures that will commemorate history. Uh, we are going to use uh, uh, windmill blades to outline the path of the Parthenon, Stonehenge, the Indian meeting circles, and the Carter windmill, all in a, an attempt to show the historical trends from Greek to Northern Europe to Native Americans, and the windmill is the mark of the transition to the new world of sustainable economy and sustainable energy. So we uh, request that you grant the uh, request uh, and so that we can build this project, which has been uh, uh, in design for over a year. The financing, of course, is from deposits made by uh, um, our tenant, Next Era, and we appreciate your uh, assistance. Thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me. The next speaker is Steve Wilcox, followed by Reyes Lopez. Good evening. Um, I'm Steve Wilcox from I'm South Palm Springs community. Um, uh, to, to, to heretofore, no one has mentioned with regard to item 3C concerns about pedestrian safety. In the past two weeks, I've contacted Council Member Middleton and Code Compliance Supervisor Riccio about food vending station occupying the sidewalk adjacent to Walgreens at the intersection of East Palm Canyon and Feral Smoke Tree and thus compromise in pedestrian and vehicular traffic. I would invite council members to visit this vending site to see how the following adequacies of the proposed ordinance of revisions, specifically on sidewalk clearance and location. I shared with council member and compliance supervisor a photo taken of a disabled individual in a motorized vehicle, via motorized wheelchair, having to navigate the sidewalk area regarding this uh, a, a sidewalk facility. Um, a, a standard ADI compliant motorized wheelchair or mobility scooter is 27 inches in width. The ordinances proposed would then allow for a total of a margin of 21 inches, less than one foot per side of clearance. It's clear that a 48 inch clearance, although the minimum for ADA is not sufficient and that the current 72 inch clearance requirement should be maintained. Furthermore, the proposed four feet or 48 inches of sidewalks clearance from a vending area does not take into consideration the customer footprint, as sometimes customers are lined up one and two abreast to access the, ops, the, the vending site, thus further reducing the clearance for any pedestrian or on the sidewalk. Um, Perhaps the city's attorney can also further define the term residential zones. The location I have referenced is commercial on one corner with residences on the opposite three quarters. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Reyes Lopez, followed by Jenny Fote. So, Jenny Fote. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Stiles. <laughs> um, I am very excited to be assisting Mr. Noble with this project. Um, he helped rescue the Air Museum uh, many years ago, and as we all know, it is a very successful tourist attraction and learning experience for, for children and adults. Um, the new project proposed by Wintech and Desert Peak Energy will be as important as that for a learning experience. It will teach and trace uh, art and culture and uh, the history and future of renewable energy in the Coachella Valley. There's been a suggestion that the project doesn't belong before the Arts Commission, uh, excuse me, that it doesn't fit the ordinance of the Arts Commission, and staff report clearly outlines that it does. Um, we did appear before the Arts Commission, but what they suggested was impossible for us to do. They suggested they wanted the project moved into the inner city, uh, which on its face would be an impossibility. As you can see from the proposal, uh, the blades weigh an enormous amount of money, uh, amount of, of weight, and it would take 
uh, cranes to bring them in, and there's very many of them. Uh, we also have ordinances against having windmills in, within, you know, next to the uh, the Hyatt. Uh, I don't think that would be appropriate, um, uh, and it could not be erected in the city. This windmill is, is that we're we're putting up is is an artifact. Uh, it is was the first of the windmills in the Coachella Valley, and it is the last existing uh, uh, artifact from that, from that era. Um, so I'm very excited about the project. I think that it's going to be a learning experience for everyone, and that it will eventually will house a museum uh, tracing all of the renewable energy uh, that's now in the Coachella Valley, because we are really the, the heart of renewable energy. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and move to the public comment that's on the phone, and then hopefully our other in-person speakers will be here once that's over. On the phone, we have Kathy Wermick. Hello. My name is Kathy Wermick, uh, Mayor Gardner, Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein, and Honorable Member of the Council. I'm here on item 3B. I want to support the public art proposal by Wintech Energy in the northern portion of the city. The site is really an appropriate site for public art. Uh, the windmill tours are popular. I've taken them. I've sent my family and people who've come to visit, and everyone has loved them. They're also a tourist spot for children in the valley who come for a learning experience. Um, public art fees should be used for public art near or at where the project is paying for the public art in the spirit of our ordinance. It shouldn't be that public art only belongs downtown. It should be spread out all over Palm Springs. And I, I'm testifying today because I had an experience with Asina where our uh, pub, and we have beautiful public art there, but our developer was never reimbursed for it and finally gave up. And it doesn't seem fair to me that if we have that ordinance on the books, that we should we should reimburse um, developers who are who've who've requested public art on on or close to their site. So I'm very much in favor of this project. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Joy Meredith. Good evening. Ah. Okay, I am unmuted. Good evening. My name is Joy Brown Meredith, and I did want to address you this evening. Uh, in regards to uh, 3C, the uh, vendor ordinance. I was very surprised to see that uh, this has gotten to this point without having what we would normally have, and that was would be some uh, stakeholder meetings. It's a little hard to get all your thoughts into a two minute public comment time. Um, and generally, we would have had stakeholder meetings on any issue as important as this, just to help make sure that we have uh, an ordinance that is acceptable to everybody, including uh, the street vendors. Uh, one of the things that I did want to point out just very briefly is I know that there will be others making comment and that have sent letters, is just that I wanted to point out that I, I hear that, um, that they don't require some of the things uh, that that we as brick and mortars need. Just one thing I in particular is I'm required to have a city engineer come out at a cost of over $500 for me to just have an A-frame sign on the brick area. And uh, street vendors don't have that same requirement. So they could have an actual whole business in that same area and um, I couldn't even have my A-frame sign there. So I think that there's just a lot of uh, details in this that should be rethought and I would really love to see an opportunity for more discussion 
on this subject with the restaurateurs especially, but retailers and other businesses as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think we're still missing a couple of people who had wanted to make public comment who were stuck in traffic. Uh, but at this time, we actually have to call the Palm Springs Housing Authority special meeting to order as well. So we will go ahead and do that. And uh, it's my understanding, City Clerk, you need to do an, another roll call, right? Council Member DeHart. Here. Council Member Hostage. Here. Council Member Middleton. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein. Here. Mayor Garner. Here. Five members present. Thank you. Uh, I do want to just say at the top of this, I know that we had some folks coming from quite a distance to speak, the two who are not here yet, and I am going to go ahead and give them an opportunity to speak once they, once they do arrive, uh, just as a, as a courtesy. We don't always do that, but I do know they were traveling far, and it's only two. We'll move to the next item in the meantime. The next, oh, I'm sorry. The next item is the consent calendar. I'll entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar uh, as it stands with no items removed. So moved. Do we have a second? A second. Thank you. City Clerk, can we have a roll call vote? Council Member Hostage? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein? Yes. Council Member DeHart? Yes. Council Member Middleton? Aye. Mayor Garner? Yes. M motion passes 5 0. And at this time, I will now close the special meeting of the Palm Springs Housing Authority. That item was on our consent calendar, and we are now complete with that. Hmm. Very easy meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the next item is item 2A, conduct a tax and equity fiscal responsibility act hearing for the proposed issuance of revenue bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority in an amount not to exceed $20 million for the purpose of assisting Community Preservation Partners LLC to acquire and re rehabilitate Sunnyview Villas at 2900 North Indian Canyon Drive. I'll turn it over to Mr. Jay Verrata. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Uh, this is a request to conduct a public hearing pursuant to the Federal Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act, or TEFRA. TEFRA requires that a public hearing be held by the governing body of the jurisdiction in which a project to be financed with tax exempt financing is located and that the governing body approve the proposed financing. Community Preservation Partners has asked that the municipal, California Municipal Finance Authority of the, uh, be the issuer of tax exempt financing in an amount not to exceed $20 million uh, for the acquisition, rehabilitation and improvement of a uh, multifamily rental housing project at 2900 North Indian Canyon Drive in Palm Springs. A new regulatory agreement will be recorded on the property to maintain affordability at the project for 55 years until 2078. The property acquisition costs will be approximately 11.4 million. The rehabilitation work will be approximately 3.9 million, and the balance of funds, 4.7 million, will be used for architect, engineering, legal tax, credit fees, bond fees, and other contingencies. Uh, council members, it is recommended that the council adopt a resolution approving the issuance of bonds by the CMFA for the benefit of the borrower. Such adoption is solely for the purpose of satisfying the requirements of TEFRA, uh, at California Code Section 6500. And staff is available to answer questions you may have. And we also have uh, the uh, financing team available on Zoom for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Does, oh, <laughs> does this council have any questions for staff at this time? Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, Jay, I have a couple questions. Uh, with, with the um, renovation, Will that change the, the mix of level of affordability in terms of media income? It uh, says I, right now you're at a certain number of two bedrooms that are 30%, a certain number that are 60%. Correct. Well, it'll be the same tenants. There will be no change to the income uh, mix. So okay. 
uh, that, that will go unchanged. And the other question, what happens to the residents while the renovation is going on inside their units? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Residents will have to be out of their units from 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 p.m. for the work in their units to be done. Uh, but during that time, they will have access uh, to their amenities uh, in, in their units. They, they will still be able to come back and uh, use their faucet, showers, and appliances. Uh, and the units will be sanitized uh, before the residents do come back into their units, which is to say, let me, let me back up. The residents, while the work is being done, the residents uh, will have to be outside of the unit, but will uh, have a, uh, access to a hospitality area in the community building of the, of the property. And we will also have food there. Now, when the residents have access to all the amenities in their unit is when they return, they will be functioning. And uh, if there are problems, the uh, developer, the buyer uh, has a, a contact person for them to talk to to address any issues if their units are not sanitized properly. And the, the ADA uh, um, residents? Correct. Um, <clears throat> there are five uh, Americans with Disabilities Act residents, ADA, uh, who will actually be relocated to a hotel for 30 days while their units are being um, rehabilitated because the work on th those units are uh, a bit more extensive than the uh, other unit uh, so that they can have all the ADA uh, uh, um, measures installed into those units. Okay. And does anyone from the city check with the residents while this is going on to make sure they're okay? Uh, not on a regular basis, uh, but we haven't had too many of these uh, in the last couple of years, maybe two, one other in-place rehab project was done. We did not get any complaints from the residents through that, but we do maintain communication with the, with the properties. Okay, those are my questions. My comment will just be to make sure that we, someone checks on them. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Holstage. Thank you, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, we received public comment uh, on this item, so specific requests from residents or neighbors. Uh, Jay, if you have that public comment, but it asks about additional on-site resident and visitor parking and the need for that and the difficulty parking on site and many other residents uh, parking nearby and dealing with vehicle thefts or catalytic converter thefts, things like that. Um, they ask for turf removal to remove all the lawns and the turf. They say that there's a lot of um, major water waste happening on the site, water running down the street, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they ask about the Sunnyview Villas is smoke-free housing because of HUD or the Housing Authority, and so asking if that can be remained uh, can remain, excuse me, and then um, exterior aesthetics and how that'll interact with the um, AAC or Architectural Advisory Committee. So I just wanted to flag those for you. It's not typical that we get public comments on items like this, and so I think it's important to respond to them. Um, if you can do that now, or we can also open public uh, comment, and then if you could respond on the record to those um, at that time. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Uh, we may wait to have the uh, developer participating uh, make comments on that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for staff at this time? Seeing none, at this time I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. I do not have any speakers. Madam Clerk, do you have any speakers? Madam Mayor, we have no public commenters for this item. Thank you so much. Uh, then we will, the public hearing is now closed. Is there, are there any additional questions? Well, or, well, I guess you have questions, Councilmember Holster, so if we can address those with the developer you said who's here. Uh, right, I'm not sure if we could uh, let them in. I do have a list of the uh, improvements on the interior, uh, which includes uh, water, uh, uh, low flow toilets, efficient shower heads, uh, Water, certif water sense certified bathroom and kitchen sink aerators uh, on the exterior. Um, that includes windows, roofs, lighting, uh, fire extinguishers throughout. 
I did not see the extensive list of other improvements, uh, Council Member Holstage, that uh, you had mentioned, but we can uh, make that request of the developer or just find out if there are any barriers to doing so and uh, work with them in that sense. Is the developer on the line? Yes, good evening. Hi, everyone, members of the council. My name is Belinda Lee. I'm a development director with Community Preservation Partners, um, the developer for Sunnyview Villa. And to address some of these comments, um, as far as uh, the first thing I believe I heard was regarding the parking and additional parking. Um, unfortunately, due to current constraints and, and code requirements, um, we are constrained in our ability to add additional parking um, as it pertains to smoke-free housing. We will be continuing that and any other sort of HUD regulations and guidelines that we are required to follow. So that um, will not change. Um, as far as uh, visibility and any sort of safety as it pertains to theft, we will be adding a camera system to the site to ensure that any areas on site and even um, street facing, we will have um, a system that will monitor any activity on site. And I did also hear there was a concern regarding um, the exteriors and the architecture. And we do take into consideration certainly um, the necessity for the building to fit into the fabric of the surrounding neighborhood. So any sort of paint upgrades um, or exterior upgrades, we will ensure that it does fit into the surrounding community. Um, and I believe the water efficiency was addressed. So we are looking to um, have low flow toilets and faucets and showers. And as far as the exteriors, we are looking to install low flow and drip irrigation as well. And there was a question about the turf removal. Will that be occurring? That is currently not contemplated in the scope um, at this moment. It is something that we are looking at um, pending funding availability and how the scope and the renovation shakes out. That is something that I would like to um, include closer towards the end of the renovation. Thank you very much. Does council have any additional questions for the developer while they're on the line? Council member DeHart. I wasn't following you on the, uh, the parking um, issue. You said you, you're maxed out on parking due to regulations, HUD regulations? Not HUD re regulations. It's really constrained to the size that the spaces need to be. So as far as finding any additional space, um, there's really not any additional areas that we could add additional parking. Hmm. So the comment that was sent in says that there's currently a plenty of prop. The property currently has uh, a lot of unnecessary land and turf plenty of room for additional on-site parking, and about 50% of the Sunnyville residents uh, have no choice to, but to park off street. So there's a contradictory feeling here. The turf is really more centrally located, um, so it would be removing turf that's really in the center of the property and not the surrounding areas. The way the parking is situated currently is around the perimeter of the property. Thank you. Of course. Council Member Holstage. Not a question, just a flag for the applicant or the developer <laughs> that the city and Desert Water Agency do have a turf removal rebate program if it's still open and the city was also considering adding additional funding. So there might be other funding that you might pursue to pursue the turf a removal if you do find areas where there's significant water waste and the turf isn't needed for residents. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So Thank you, that is very helpful. We will definitely be looking into that. Just to confirm, how many parking spaces do you have on site for the 44 units? Um, I don't know off the top of my head here. If you give me a moment, I could look that up. Were there any other questions while I was pulling me. that up? I do not see any at this time.
Councilmember Holstich. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have a follow-up. Um, you said that you're primarily doing interior upgrades, and those are listed here, um, but you stated that you might paint the exterior or do architectural improvements for the exterior. Do you have any of that planned, or do you contemplate, contemplate that in this project? I'm sorry, the question was for the, I'm sorry, I was looking up the, uh, the parking spaces. If I could address that, um, that first, there are 70 regular parking spaces and there are four handicapped spaces. Thank you. And as far as the exterior renovations, um, we are planning to install um, new roofing, new AC units. Those are pretty old, the, the water heaters, um, there is a centrally located playground, so we will be doing improvements to that as well. Um, the parking in the area, the parking lots, have not been sealed and slurried for a while, so we will be making improvements to that. And um, there will be some extensive concrete work also to make sure that there are sufficient ADA pathways throughout the property. Great, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from council at this time? Is there a motion? I move that we adopt the resolution as presented by staff approving the issuance of uh, multifamily housing revenue bonds. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Madam Clerk. Yes, ma'am. Council Member DeHore. Yes. Council Member Holstich. Yes. Council Member Middleton. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein. Yes. Mayor Gardner. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. The next item is item 2B, a public hearing for a request by Rios on behalf of Old Las Palmas Partners, LLC, for the approval of a change of zone application to amend the current split zone de designations of the Central Business District and limited multiple family residential to C1 retail business for a proposed mixed use project, which includes 24 residential condominium units and a 5,411 square foot commercial space on 2.5 acres of undeveloped parcels located at 575 North Palm Canyon Drive. Mr. Good Hadwin. Evening. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of council. This item, as the mayor just said, is a request for a change of zone from R2 slash CBD to C1 for a property located at 575 North Palm Canyon Drive. The application was submitted by Rios on behalf of Old Las Palmas Partners, LLC. The subject site is 2.4 acres in size and is currently vacant. It is located north of downtown, uh, bound by North Palm Canyon to the east, West Chino Drive to the south, and Ballardo Road to the west. A 30-foot utility and drainage easement uh, owned by Riverside County is located just to the north of the property, which you can see there just outside the boundary. The site is currently designated in the general plan as Central Business District, which allows a mix of commercial and residential uses, such as those proposed. The zoning for the site, as I mentioned, is currently split between two different designations, being R2 on the western portion of the site and CBD on the eastern portion of the site. To the east are single-family, low-density homes in the Las Palmas community. To the south, largely focused south of Alejo, we have a mix of residential and commercial uses consistent for our downtown area. And to the north and east, we largely see a mix of smaller-scale commercial uses within the midtown area. As part of this proposal, the applicant is proposing to construct a mixed-use project that consists of 24 residential condominium units, 5,400 square feet of commercial use largely uh, or, uh, fronting on Palm Canyon, uh, as well as a small courtyard space adjacent to the commercial uses and associated common and private uh, commercial, sorry, open spaces associated with the residential uses. So this includes a pool, a spa, there are some outdoor amenity spaces, outdoor kitchen, and then some of the units also have individual uh, open spaces and pools. This is the proposed site plan, which shows the commercial space again concentrated along Palm Canyon. Uh, with the residential uses behind to the west. Access will be provided via Ballardo Road with individual garages located off the shared drive aisle, which is shown there on the top portion of the site plan. 
There will also be internal pedestrian path pathways to provide access to the common spaces, which are located sort of in the bottom half of the plan, as well as to an access gate. Let me see if I can point, uh, which will be provided here through that interior uh, commercial courtyard that I mentioned, which will provide access to Palm Canyon as well as to those commercial spaces. The buildings adjacent to Bellardo are proposed to be one story in height to allow a transition to the adjacent low density neighborhood, while the overall development is proposed to be a maximum of two stories uh, or 24 feet for the residential uses really in the interior of the site uh, and 30 feet for the commercial spaces on Palm Canyon. The development will have a combination of one, two and three bedroom units. I also wanted to note that the applicant has included a residential gate to control access to the interior of the site, which is set back over 85 feet from Bellardo. So the gate itself is actually located here, um, past that sort of arrival court and some other parking that's, that will be located on the other side of the gate. Um, they have argued um, that they need that gate to control the mix of, of, of access to the site. Given that it is a mixed use project, the concern is that some people or even deliveries trying to access the commercial spaces may try to use that residential portion of the site and create circulation issues. I also wanna note that the CBD designation within the general plan, which is not being changed, generally requires a minimum of 21 units per acre for residential uses and a maximum of 30 units per acre. However, a general plan amendment was approved by the city council last fall, which lowered that minimum level to 10 units per acre for mixed use developments where 75% of the frontage on a major thoroughfare is providing publicly accessible commercial uses. So that is what we are seeing here and that is the justification for the 10 units per acre that is proposed as part of this development. Uh, the change of zone application that is before you today is not seeking to amend or modify that, that density that is permitted by the general plan today. Wanted to show you some renderings of the project. So this is the view to the north and west taken from Palm Canyon. So you can sort of see the residential uses in behind as well as the commercial experience along Palm Canyon. They have designed the buildings uh, so that there is a bit of an overhang on Palm Canyon to provide some shading and some relief from the sun. And they are maintaining the palm trees along Palm Canyon. Palm Canyon again to help provide shading. There will be a sidewalk constructed along West Chino where there is, uh, there is not one today uh, to provide access both to those units along there as well as for the general public who will be traveling. I also wanted to provide here some additional renderings of the site. So on the top left, you can see again that view from the south looking up Palm Canyon and you have that sort of uh, commercial space flanking that corner. Uh, which is proposed to be uh, two stories in height uh, with then the, the commercial uses continuing up. On the bottom left, you can see sort of the opposite view looking south along Palm Canyon. So again, you have a two-story commercial use at the, at the top and bottom of the site, and then you have commercial spaces in between that are proposed to be one story with uh, an apartment unit above. On the top right, uh, you get uh, the view of the gate and the access from Bellardo. So again, looking at how that gate is set back 85 feet from Bellardo and is screened with other design elements to sort of minimize the view of that gate from Bellardo. And then on the bottom right, uh, you have the view along Chino Drive, uh, which are residential uses with individual access. So in order to proceed, the applicant is seeking the change of zone that I mentioned uh, that will take the current split R2 and CBD zoning and, and are proposing to make it a single C1 zone. Having a single zoning designation will allow the site to develop under one set of development standards, facilitating better overall design of the project. The C1 zone was selected to reflect the surrounding zoning that extends northward along this portion of Palm Canyon into Mid Midtown. Uh, and I just want to note the CBD zone that, had, that is on the site today typically is again concentrated south of Alejo, more in this downtown CBD area of the city. Um, in terms of the process to date, the Planning Commission did hold several meetings related to the project since it was filed in 2010. They first held a study session in January of 2021. They then held a series of subcommittee meetings earlier this year, uh, as well as two public hearings, the first in December and the last in February of 2023, where they did recommend approval of the project. 
Um, they are recommending that the city council approve the zone change and there are three other associated applications. There is a major development permit, tentative track map and variance application, which were all approved by the planning commission on February 8th, contingent on approval by city council tonight. I do also wanna note that that major development permit will go to the architectural review committee should you vote to advance the zone change uh, where they will review the architectural and landscape design. Um, the findings related to the change of zone are listed here um, that were made by the Planning Commission. So the first is that the change of zone is consistent with the general plan. The second is that the project site is suitable for the proposed uses, being residential and commercial. The third, that the change of zone application approval will allow the seamless and consistent development throughout the site under one set of development standards rather than the sort of two different sets that exist under split zoning today. And finally, that the approval of the application will allow the extension of the C1 zone uh, to be consistent with what we're seeing along this portion of North Palm Canyon. That concludes my recommendation. We are uh, recommending that city council introduce and waive further reading of the ordinance and approve the change of zone application subject to the conditions of approval. I mentioned that this will go to ARC following your decision and the applicants are also present to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, does council have any questions for staff? Council member DeHart. Hey Chris, can you share with us uh, the number of affordable housing units that will be here included? And if so, there aren't any, why aren't there any? Sure, uh, good question. So there are. this is a market rate development. I think the applicant can sort of speak to some of the economics behind their decision making. I would say, you know, this was has not been identified in our housing element to date as a site for low or moderate income housing. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't really engage in a conversation around affordable housing on the site when it first came in in 2020, nor did the Planning Commission in their process. I think the applicant can again speak to some of their decision making. Um, but again, it wasn't really identified as a site for affordable housing in our housing element, nor do we have sort of the inclusionary housing tools available to us to engage in that conversation. Thank you. I'm going to jump in there because my question's along the same lines. Uh, uh, to our city attorney, is it possible, since we have not received an inclusionary zoning ordinance in front of us, but it has been something that council has discussed in the past, is it possible with this zone amendment for us to require say 10% of the units to be for moderate income uh, families? You know, until some recent amendments at the state level dealing with state housing laws, I would have said uh, yes, the council could uh, make impose those requirements because the council could simply deny the zone change. Uh, however, the Housing Affordability Act uh, from a couple of years ago, 2019, imposed some limitations on cities' ability to deny housing projects, which this is. Uh, and so uh, I don't think we would be able to deny it uh, or therefore condition them to uh, include uh, affordable units. You could certainly ask them to and have those negotiations, but uh, I think it would be uh, difficult to, to impose it. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions for staff at this time? Council Member Holstage. Thank you. Uh, I have questions about density. Thank you for the excellent uh, staff report. Really appreciate all the information, especially the, the verbal one you just gave right now. Um, so can you share a little bit? That was my question about the minimum density, and it's a lower density than we're used to seeing, and so I understand that was change. But what is right. the – sometimes we get a chart, and I did find it, I think, in one of the – Planning Commission staff right. reports about what would be the minimum density under the CBD and the current zoning versus what we're approving if we approve a zone change to C1. Yeah, so, so the CBD designation is really what establishes the density threshold on this site, and that's not changing. So t typically it's 21 to 30 units per acre, as I said. Uh, however, we did, uh, the council did adopt the amendment in the fall to the general plan that allows for a lower threshold in two instances. So the first was for second story commercial units, typically more in downtown, where we're looking to convert those to apartments, and you're running into limitations with your density level levels. So that is now permitted uh, with no sort of floor uh, on the density level. The second was for mixed use developments that were providing substantial. Uh, publicly accessible commercial uses along a major thoroughfare. We landed on 75% as being the right number. So in this case, they have more than 75% of their frontage on Palm Canyon, where they're providing, we think, good and active commercial use. And to accommodate that and understanding that, you know, the layering on of zoning of the zoning code and the general plan requirements and sort of when you're 
developing out of site, that lowers their ability to meet that minimum density threshold on the balance of the site. So we did make that exception to lower it to 10 in those instances, and 10 is the number that they've come in with. So they're at the bottom level of so that. So that's yes. the absolute minimum Correct. under the change. And if it was CBD, if the zone change didn't go forward, this is 2.5 acres, 2.4. So it could be up to, what, 62 or... So it could be up to, up to, to 60, 65 units uh, under. Um, but again, the, the CBD zoning on the site, um, the zone change itself is not what is what is changing the density limit. The general plan is what dictates that, and that is staying as CBD. Yeah, I understand. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions for staff? Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yeah, just, can you just clarify why Planning Commission allowed the gate I think the, the applicant says it's for, for to prevent retail traffic and security, which recently we denied someone. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think the nuance here is that we have a mixed-use development with, with commercial uses, and I think the concern that was expressed by the applicant uh, was, was less about sort of pedestrian movement through the site and more about vehicular movement through the site. So in this case, we have commercial uses that will be, you know, having commercial visitors as well as loading and deliveries, and the concern was, you know, path of least resistance, those vehicles may choose to enter the residential portion of the site, park at the back end of the commercial spaces, and access them that way. And so the gate is really to prevent those com that commercial traffic from flowing through the residential portion of the site. It, it's a little bit different than recent examples that the city council uh, saw and is aware of where that was just a residential site and we didn't have that same concern about the mixing of uses. The finding that the commission needs to make in order to grant uh, the gate is really talking about you know, minimizing conflicts and making sure that there's appropriate circulation. So the Planning Commission and their decision found that unlike the other site that, that we saw recently, there is a legitimate concern here around circulation uh, and, and separating uses uh, and traffic conflicts on this site that they didn't see on the other one. The other reason that they gave in making that decision was, uh, and I can go back to the drawing, that we have, I think it's 87 feet that the gate is set back from Bellardo as opposed to other developments where we see it typically right at the frontage. And again, because of some of the other uses in front of the gate, um, and we can even go to the rendering in that uh, sort of top left uh, picture, top right picture, sorry. Um, it's screened and you're not really getting the visual appearance of the gate from Bellardo as you're walking through. So it still feels as though this development is integrated into the surrounding community and you don't have the sort of visual appearance of the gate that you might in other developments. That, that was their decision making process. Okay, thank you very much. And um, also, have you ha seen any indication of what kind of retail is gonna be there? Um, I, I would ask that the applicant should speak to that. Okay, awesome. I will say that in our discussions with them uh, and with the subcommittee and trying to sort of, we, we made the depth of the commercial spaces uh, deeper, we made the heights higher uh, through the subcommittee process with the planning commission and the goal of that was really to keep the spaces as flexible as possible to allow the widest array of users. So I don't know that they have specific users or tenants in mind, but we did through the subcommittee process try to make sure that the commercial spaces were as flexible as possible to accommodate Okay. Lots of different Thank you. I'm just going to bring this up again later because previous council adopted something to the general plan to promote and support locally owned businesses and unique retail. So that is something I would like to see. Um, also, in terms of these these uh, these residential units, can they be used as short-term vacation rentals? Do you know? Um, they would have to go through the same process, um, you know, and be subject to sort of okay. the, the changes. But you haven't heard whether they are? They haven't indicated okay. whether they would okay. pursue that. Okay, thank you, those are my questions. Thank you, at this time I'd like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. We do have several speakers. In house we have Peter Mahler followed by Mark Rios. Hi, my name is Peter Mahler and I wanna thank all of you. Welcome to the new city manager. Great to have you here. Cincinnati has a great ballpark. Uh, I've lived in the neighborhood for part-time for 22 years and visited La Sierra University for 17 years to talk to them about the site because I think it is so important. I wanna to speak to the affordable housing. I think it's very important. 
I think this is a site where it economically doesn't work. We are looking at several other sites. I also want to speak to your question about local retail. We own El Paseo Plaza, which is where the workshop kitchen and bar is, Candace held, Elizabeth and Prince, super simple. They're all local retailers, and we have worked for 14 years through all sorts of ups and downs to uh, have that building filled with local retailers. So on behalf of my partners and our team, I thank all of you. Any other questions? If we have questions later and you're the right person, we'll let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Mark Rios. Thank you very much for letting me speak on behalf of the project. Um, I just want to start and say that we've been designing this project for a long time. And um, we've had a lot of different programs and different iterations of it. And we've explored many, many different densities. Um, the owners never came to us and said, we want a place that serves this many units. And they always said, please design a place that really fits here. And so there has been really, um, I'm going to say excruciating care to examine the scale at every single edge of the project to see what the relationships are to Palm Canyon, to Chino, to Old Las Palmas behind it. And so the, the project has been really fine-tuned in that way. Um, if this were a denser project, we would have um, probably two-story in the back. All along Chino, it varies between one story and two stories and two stories and one story and two stories and one story because we're trying to make it have a variety and have a fit. Um, we've done much more dense housing projects in our office. And typically, there are really much larger double-loaded quarter buildings. They're much denser. Instead of being a, a sort of glass or open facing unit through sort of a deep facing unit and it builds a really different kind of architecture and in our earlier studies we looked at some of these denser things but it really required first off a complete podium for the site so that parking would be accomplished by that podium and then very dense buildings on top of it and um, I think it was actually kind of horrifying to look at what would happen to this site if that kind of density was put on it because of all those requirements. And so um, we kept sort of looking again from the outside at what is the right fit for this site from an urban design point of view. And I can assure you that it wasn't based on a pro forma and it wasn't based on a number of units. It was based on what's right for the city. And this is an extremely important site and it should have a, a knitting quality that knits in all the surrounding um, neighborhoods and building masses and not feel like this huge thing Thank stuck you. there. Thank so, you, Mr. Rios. Thank you. Next, we have Brian Adamson on the phone. Brian, are you there? If we don't have Brian, do we have Anna Chaudhary? Madam Clerk, can you confirm if those speakers are in the queue? Confirming now. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Is that this Brian Adamson? Yes, this is this is Brian. Thank you thank so you. much. Go ahead. Um, just re real quick, I just wanted to thank the council for um, the consideration of this project. I am a partner and developer for this as well, and it's been a it's been a long process working with staff and and the plan commission to get to this point, and uh, truly appreciate um, all that we have um, done here, and and are really excited about this project. Um, I think Mark and Peter covered most of the things. However, I just wanted to mention on the gate, um, that is something that we have worked very hard to limit just again to restricting the unwanted traffic from the commercial into that. And I also wanna point out that this is not a gated community. Um, we have access points to many of the residences along um, 
several of the roads uh, that circle this project. So there are private residents that, residents that can come right off of the right of way into those residences. So we really did wanna bring this in and create a really community feel here. And I think we achieved that through several of the study sessions that we had with the commission. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. Thank you. Anna Chaudhary? Yes, Madam Chair, I am here on behalf of the Altum Group. We are the consultants that prepared the ISMND. I'm just here to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you very um, much. All right, at this time, I'd like to close the public hearing. Are there any additional questions or comments from council? Councilmember Middleton. Yes, uh, questions for the applicant. Um, if you could come forward, thank you. Uh, and first, uh, just a comment, this is a beautiful uh, project and it is a critically important uh, corner and a critically important part of our community. Uh, so They deserve the credit. Uh, well, I was very, very impressed with what I saw. Um, but we also have a history of some uh, beautiful projects coming before us and then lying fallow for uh, years, if not decades. So uh, what's the funding that you need to make this project work and do you have it? We are completely funded. That is not a concern. When we renovated 830 in 800 North Palm Canyon, we were 100% under construction in 2008. There's that little bump in September. And we finished 100% of our construction with private funding and we're 100% leased. Wonderful. And we continue to follow that same business pattern. So if you receive approval this evening, uh, what would you tell the public would be a realistic time that you would expect to see construction begin and occupancy uh, for this project? I would want to start tomorrow, but what I would do is I would ask Brian Adamson, who's listening, All who's right. in charge of that, to text me the answer to that question because he's in charge of the construction. Great. And we're using D.W. Johnston as our builder. We can, so we can have Brian answer that question on the record. He's still on the line. Go ahead. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, we are through the design and development stage of this project. As you can see, we're very detailed in our, in our plans at this point. Um, the next step for us is just to get through the construction drawing phase and then through the obviously the permitting phase. Now, you know, tonight's not the last approval we need. Um, you know, we still have to go through all of our building uh, approvals as well. But um, we are truly full speed ahead on this project, as Peter mentioned. And, um, you know, we have the team engaged, the contractor engaged, ready to complete those drawings and begin. Our hope would be by the end of this year, we would have a shovel in the ground. Thank you. And completion and occupancy? This is probably, you know, a year and a half ago, this was probably an 18 month construction project. Mm -hmm. It's probably more like a 24 month construction project at this point. All right, thank you. I'm looking for realistic dates, not optimistic dates. Yeah, well, I am. Then I give you the 24. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We are uh, a get it done sort of group. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you. I'll, I'll let you know if we do. Are there any other questions or comments from council? Com comments are allowed or questions. Well, I, I'm just going to say it is a beautiful looking project, and uh, I'm glad. I mean, I'm. Sorry we're going to miss all the events that happened on that empty lot, but um, it does help a lot um, for all the surrounding area to have a continual uh, a continuum on Palm Canyon. So I, I do like that very much. Um, I think this also raises a point for City Council on, on bringing back an inclusionary housing ordinance, whether or not it's at this location, at least to have funds paid into, into some kind of affordable housing. Um, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mahler. I do know the stores that, and businesses that you have, and I will always ask this question for anybody who does retail because um, I believe that our, our locally owned businesses and unique retail is an essential part of our downtown. So I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for commitment to uh, 
continuing to do that. Um, and it is very reassuring to hear that this is 24 months and not years and years and years. So those are my comments, and, and I do like, I really do appreciate how, how much design uh, effort went into this. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have other comments or questions? I go, go ahead, Councilman Paul Go first. <laughs> All right. Uh, this project does look beautiful. It'll be nice to see that strip of uh, Palm Canyon activated. It, it is disappointing to know that we don't have a inclusionary zoning ordinance yet. I do understand that that is coming forward. Uh, but as we've seen, there have been several projects since the council first discussed this. And we, we ha don't have any way of requiring you to pay in lieu fees or to actually put affordable housing on your site, which is... Um, not great for us since we need that so much. So I just want to make sure that that's clear for the community and for any developers that are going to be coming forward to Palm Springs. We do need affordable housing at all income levels. Uh, so we do hope that you'll come forward with those projects in the future. Councilmember Holstage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well said. I just also wanted to echo um, those sentiments and also just say it's a beautifully designed project. And it's so, um, I'm so glad that Mr. Rios is designing all this housing and not me, which he described the density I was looking for. It was more of a comment to staff because I see, you know, we have limited open land available, especially in our downtown. It really is more a comment about our zoning update and looking at where we do want density and where we don't. I mean, I really appreciate you designing a project and thinking of a project that fits the neighborhoods because that's what the neighbors really want. Um, but we do have to think about density long term as we have some limited um, areas in downtown where dense housing can go. Um, so just, I, I love these, I love this project. I think it's beautiful. I can't wait for it to be you know, preserved in 30 years. Um, so thank you for the beautiful design um, and bringing forward the project and looking forward to doing the inclusionary zoning and then the zoning update uh, together as council. So I'm proud to support this project. Thank you. Is there a motion? Council Member DeHart. A minor comment on um, understanding the the amount of bus traffic and uh, customers that are using the bus and getting on and off the bus at that corner. And I, I didn't see it until earlier today, the bus stop that's designed uh, for the space. And I think it, it's beautiful. Um, but I just want to make sure that there's the clear understanding with staff and with you all, the, the, the amount of traffic that comes through on that corner. Um, we need to be aware of, um, you know, how does that bus, how do those buses stopping so frequently, is that going to cause interruption going into the intersection or to that retail store right behind the bus stop itself? But I think other than that, uh, I applaud the, the work that you all have put into it, and, and it's, a, it's a great addition to go into that block. And I thank the uh, Planning Commission for their work on getting it to this point. Councilmember uh, Middleton. Move to approve. I'll second. Great. We have a, mo a for motion and a second. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Middleton. Aye. Councilmember Hostage. Yes. Councilmember DeHart. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein. Yes. Mayor Gardner. Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. We do have. Uh, our public comment speaker from earlier who was stuck in traffic here. So I will give the floor to uh, Juan Espinosa to give his public comment before we move forward. Thank you, Mayor Grace, for the courtesy and good evening, Council. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak today. Um, and I also want to thank you all for engaging in a thoughtful process. Uh, to finally bring in and welcome street vendors to the Palm Springs community, um, which is the right, not just the right thing to do, but it's also uh, what the state legislature intended, which was for cities to support and be able to enable street vending to occur and not create barriers or make it more difficult um, for a community that is largely working class, largely women of color. And so I think Palm Springs should want to promote and support this community um, and wanted to comment on the ordinance as it stands. I think it's a good ordinance. It could be improved. Uh, there are a number of parts to the ordinance that I think are important to address. Um, and I also want to quickly uh, 
address the economic protectionism and the question of competition with other small businesses, and I don't think that's the question, that's an issue here. There's a misconception that there's competition, and in reality, street vendors create foot traffic, they create set safety, they revitalize areas that are often left blighted, and so all of the research actually indicates to the contrary that street vendors are actually promoting business and creating a more vital economy. And so in actuality, most of their money and the cycle of money that goes through street vendors actually stays more locally in the local economy. So it's a very smart policy for the city of Palm Springs. Um, and it's something that business entities and business interests in Palm Springs should want to support. And I would question why uh, this group isn't being supported. And, and maybe we look in the mirror and see uh, and ask those questions of why these businesses are not being supported versus other businesses in Palm Springs. Um, but I would also want to address um, the issue of excluding uh, vendors from schools. There's a 500 foot exclusion zone and there, in the previous ordinance there was language of them being dangerous to children, which I think is wrong and not empirically proven and discriminatory. Um, and so there's a number of provisions that could be improved. And I, having gr grown up here in Palm Springs and experienced food at Kawea and Raymond Cree and Palm Springs High School, uh, got to enjoy that. And that was a part of our community. And so I think we should want to support vendors and, and support working class people that are trying to get by and do right by our city. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the council for allowing me to add another speaker. Uh, we do need to read the ordinance from the last item. Madam Clerk. Yes. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, approving case 5.1541 CZ, change of zone to amend the current split zone designation of Central Business District, CBD, and limited multiple family residential, R2, to retail business, C1, entirely for the proposed mixed use project, which include 24 residential condominium units and a 5.411 square foot commercial space on 2.4 acres, underdeveloped parcels located at 575 North Palm Canyon Drive, zone CBD, R2, section 10. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We are skipping item 3A. That is being moved to our next council meetings. We're now on to item 3B, which is a council request for review of a decision by the Public Arts Commission to deny an application by Desert Peak Energy and Wintech Energy for reimbursement of $375,000 in public arts funds for a public art project to be located at 62950 20th Avenue and a request for waivers of the art placement requirement. Do we have a staff report? Yes, Madam Mayor, you do. Ah, so, I'll be <laughs> thank giving you. the staff report this evening. If I could request that our TV station bring up the PowerPoint for item 3B. Uh, and while they're doing that, uh, thank you. Uh, what this is, is you have a request uh, to review the decision of the Public Arts Commission relative to a project uh, that was proposed on the north side of the freeway. Uh, by way of background, the applicants for the project are constructing a battery storage facility on two large parcels north of the freeway. As part of that project, and per the Public Arts Ordinance, they were required to pay $375,000 in fees to the Public Arts Fund. Per the Public Arts Ordinance, there are two ways that we can use those funds. Number one is that the applicant can provide the artwork. The artwork must be reviewed and approved by the Public Arts Commission. And then upon installation, those funds are reimbursed to the applicant. The second thing that they can do is they can pay the money directly into the Public Arts Fund. The Public Arts Commission can then use those funds for public arts projects throughout the city. In this particular situation, the applicants chose to provide the art themselves. In terms of the project, the applicant submitted the following information or the, the images here uh, to the Public Arts Commission for consideration. I've also included on this slide a description of the budget for the project itself. 
Uh, the art project consists of windmill blades that would be installed both vertically and horizontally uh, on a site uh, that's adjacent to uh, where the windmill tour facility is right now. And then also as part of that project, it would include the restoration of one of the original wind turbines that were installed here uh, as the applicant has testified under public comment. Uh, and so this was the scope of the project that was proposed. It would also include the painting or installation of murals on the blades themselves. Uh, the applicant allocated $20,000 for that work itself. But the majority of the funding of the project would be relative to the installation of the windmill blades and also the placement of the original wind turbine generator. The applicant submitted to us uh, uh, earlier, and we uh, sent this on to you, is some additional uh, depictions of the artwork. Uh, here it's slightly different than what was uh, shown to the Public Arts Commission. Uh, they've identified the arrangement of blades in the form of Stonehenge, and then also one uh, showing the uh, installation of blades that reflects the column placement of the Parthenon in Athens. Uh, and so this is different information than what was shown to the Public's Arts Commission, uh, but does show the Carter wind turbine as still being part of that project. In terms of the location of the project, the parcels shown in black at the upper part of this image uh, is where the battery storage facility is being constructed. Uh, however, this facility is fenced off, and so it's not accessible to the public. Typically, as a requirement of an applicant providing art, the applicant is to provide it on the property where the development is occurring. Uh, however, in this situation, because those properties are going to be fenced off, the applicant is proposing to locate the art installation closer to the I-10 freeway. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the presentation, but I just wanted to make it clear that the installation is not on the property that is being developed. In terms of the Public Arts Commission consideration of the application, they ultimately denied the request because they could not make the following findings relative to the Public Arts Ordinance. Number one was relative to the majority of the funding being used for the foundation work and the restoration of the wind turbine. Uh, and they questioned whether this was an allowed or appropriate use of the funding. Um, their approach to this was that only $20,000 was being allocated uh, to the installation of art on the blades. And so therefore, they didn't see the rest of the funding being used appropriately. Uh, as I had mentioned, again, there was a concern about the percentage of the budget that was being used for the actual artwork. Uh, also, the applicant did not provide information about the artists that would be selected or any sketches of the work. Typically, that is something that the Arts Commission requires for public arts projects, is they want to see what they're approving. And then finally, there were some comments about the location and the accessibility of the artwork. Um, as I had indicated, it's not being located on the development site, but it's close by, and uh, our ordinance does talk to the fact that when the uh, applicant is providing the artwork, it should be on the development site. Uh, and so I, I have some concerns in terms of, of that request. Um, as we look at this application before you, uh, you may be asked to look at kind of a broader definition of what is art. And here is the difficult thing, is to determine what is art in this situation. Uh, I can see in terms of the Public Arts Commission and the information that was provided to them, it was difficult for them to make that assessment. However, if you do look at what the applicant has provided to us um, uh, just earlier this week, uh, you can see that the arrangement of these blades is not the standard arrangement that you would see. Um, it's a very uh, thoughtful and intentional arrangement of the blades. And so looking at that as a sculptural piece, you could interpret this as being artwork. Again, the Public Arts Commission did not see this image, nor did they interpret the project that way. Um, another thing to take into consideration is that this is a very unique project. 
in terms of the development that was required to pay the public arts fee, it's a battery storage facility. It's not something as the last project that you just saw, the Rios project, uh, which is a mixed use project and artwork is very easily incorporated as part of that. Uh, and so I think you have to take into consideration as you look at this application that this is unique what the applicant is proposing is thematically consistent with not only the project, but the area and the history of development in that area. Uh, and so I think you can look at this as uh, a work of cultural significance, which is indicated in the purpose and intent of the public arts ordinance, that we not only look at or artwork, but pieces of cultural significance. Uh, so those are just things for you to consider uh, in addition to the consideration that was given by the Public Arts Commission. Uh, the applicant has requested two waivers. If you were to approve this application, uh, they would request the following. Number one is to allow the artwork on a parcel that is separate from the development parcel. As I had indicated earlier, because the development site is fenced, it's not accessible to the public, it makes sense to locate the artwork off-site. And then secondly, the applicant is requesting reimbursement of the $375,000 that was paid upfront prior to the installation of the work. Here's one of the conundrums of our public arts ordinance is we require the applicants to pay the fee in order to receive their building permits. We then require them, if they're going to provide the artwork, to then pay for and install the artwork and then later get the reimbursement. Uh, and so it's a little bit problematic as you look at that. They're basically paying twice for the installation of the artwork and then getting half of that back. Um, and so that's something to consider in this. In other situations, we have done uh, an agreement with applicants in terms of the construction of projects whereby they provide their invoices for the work and we don't issue the C of O for the, for the project until we receive the invoices and have properly reviewed them. And so if you were to approve these waivers, that would be one of the conditions that we would request. And then secondly, we would also request that the applicant submit artist information and sketches of the proposed work to the city staff for review and approval uh, prior to the installation. Uh, because again, that's something that is required under our public arts ordinance and that would satisfy that requirement. With that, that concludes my presentation to you. I um, am happy to answer any questions. You do have the applicant here in the audience if you have any questions for them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Flynn. Are there questions or comments? Questions? Go ahead, Mayor Middle or right, <laughs> thank Council Member Middleton. <clears throat> First question is uh, either for Flynn or for the city attorney. There was uh, questions by the Public Arts Commission as to whether or not it was legally permissible uh, for funds to be used for a project of this uh, nature. Uh, if I'm reading the staff report correctly, you are concluding that it is legally permissible. Is that correct? That is correct, but it requires us to define the entire installation as artwork right. or pieces of cultural significance. And there were some questions if uh, this was approved uh, that we would need to see artist biographies and sketches and there would need to be some follow-up. Would that follow-up work be done by the planning staff, by the planning commission or the public arts commission or someone else? What we had recommended is that city staff, in particular Jay Verrata and his team who staffs the public arts commission would review and approve that artwork. All right, good, thank you. Um, I have uh, just one or two questions for the applicant. One last question, Flynn, for you. Uh, all of this, uh, these funds, this $375,000, that results from the fact that the battery storage project is being uh, built, correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, Mr. Noble, the battery storage project, uh, could you describe... Uh, that in some general terms as to what it is, what it will accomplish for uh, our community and what the kind of time frames and costs uh, associated with this uh, full project are? Well, it is a uh, $500 million project, about 90% completed, uh, that uh, 1,600 containers containing storage batteries 
have been installed and will charge uh, during the afternoons when we have abundant solar energy. Uh, the solar is so abundant in California now that it, uh, they actually pay Arizona to take the power in the, in the hot summer afternoons. Uh, and then at night, the sun goes down and the power rates go sky high. And so with the uh, next era and uh, the desert uh, storage uh, people are doing is uh, charging the battery. This is pursuant to a, 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 a very uh, uh, intense state program to get this done, to uh, charge the batteries with the cheap power and then discharge it in the evenings and drive the price of uh, on-peak power down uh, for the benefit of the consumers. The, the uh, parent company is NextEra, which is the biggest wind energy developer and operator in, in the United States. And uh, they have the interest in restoring the original windmill here. And that's how this all came about. Uh, uh, but the battery is, uh, is the biggest one in California. Uh, it will be surpassed by one about 5% bigger about two weeks after it gets online, but it's the biggest one for now. Uh, it, the, um, these utility projects, there will be a second phase of it uh, that's already permitted, and that will be another $300 million of uh, it's almost a billion of development here in the city limits. Um, that's generally how it, what, is, what it's about. Okay. And the location where the art project would be, how close is that to the original uh, location for your ori first original windmill? It's about a quarter mile, but it's on the freeway where it can be seen. Okay. That was our thinking, is put it down where people can see it. Uh, and uh, we thought we would put lights on it when it runs. It, it, we're going to bring it back to operating condition. We're not going to run it all the time. So we thought when it runs, the lights will go on. When it doesn't run, we'll turn it, they'll go off. Because it's the last one. There were over 1,000 of these machines in the, in the United States. And this is the last one we can find. So we think it was the first one that proved that wind energy can be commercially viable. And that, that's, that's its importance, uh, uh, I think, for us. I have some comments, but no more questions. You're welcome to give comments if you'd like. Uh, well, let me start with uh, the battery storage project. Uh, just what a critical project uh, that is and how uh, excited I am, and I think we all should be, uh, that that's located in Palm Springs. Uh, a few months back, while I was in one of my other responsibilities sitting on uh, the CalPERS uh, Board of Administration, we asked for an update on all of the major green energy projects that were underway across uh, the United States that we were investing in. And this project in Palm Springs was one of the leading half dozen projects that uh, are occurring anywhere uh, in the country in terms of uh, renewable energy. Also, what we know going back 40 years ago uh, is renewable energy uh, got its start here in Palm Springs. And from a historical standpoint, uh, the preservation of the original a windmill and the preservation of the history of the contributions of Palm Springs to uh, renewable energy, I think, is something that is going to last for generations uh, to come. And when two or three generations from now, uh, they are looking at uh, uh, not a electric energy grid that is 79% uh, fueled by fossil fuel, but one that is uh, close to 100% fueled by renewable energy. I hope they're coming to Palm Springs to see the history of uh, the transition. So I, uh, I asked for this to be called up. I appreciate some of the struggles the Public Arts Commission had in their review, but uh, this is a project that we should uh, support enthusiastically. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, Councilmember DeHart. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I've been really challenged when this came forward. 
because I'm a huge uh, advocate for the arts and, and I've applauded the Public Arts Commission for uh, work that's been done for many years and uh, I'm uh, uh, drawn between you know, hearing what the Public Arts Commission sent to us and uh, stepping back and, and um, following on some of the comments by Council Member Littleton is, is really looking at how this project uh, can really um, be looked at more as a culturally significant project to promote Palm Springs role and the history uh, and, and claim our place in this wind energy market um, uh, or industry. And uh, I, I, I do feel it's the right path to go down uh, and uh, for, the, for us to approve um, what's before us, uh, but I don't want to send a message to the Arts Commission that we, um, you know, we're, we're disregarding uh, the hard work that they do here in the community. And I want to encourage them to continue to work close with us as we go down the road. And, and I look forward to other great projects from the Arts Commission. Thank you. Questions or comments from Mayor Pratam? Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions and comments. Have we ever? First question, I guess, for Flynn, have we ever had a single art project of this amount of money? I don't know that we have. Um, I'm trying to think of the last major project that we've had, uh, and I think it paid approximately $100,000 into the Public Arts Fund. Uh, but I'll confess that I don't have much history in terms of previous projects. Okay. And has the Arts Commission ever approved, have we ever approved a Public Arts project that didn't have a a rendering? I don't know that we have. They have typically had that in each and every case that comes before them. Okay. Um, and, uh, and are you confident that you had mentioned about how, how you reimburse the invoices that there, it would be as we'd be well protected to make sure it was finished? Yes, we have an agreement that we've used on other projects and we would uh, use that on this as well. Okay. Um, I had just a couple questions for the applicant, and I should, first I should say I did meet with the applicant on a different thing to see the whole site um, a few weeks ago, and this was brought up in passing, but not really discussed. It was more about seeing the battery storage. I should have said that first. I yes, apologize. Uh, so the question is, is, is this, what hours would this be accessible to the public, and could they tour the whole Parthenon and, and Stonehenge, or just see it? The answer is yes, they can tour it. We don't have the hours completely defined, but essentially uh, 9 to 5. Uh, uh, and then uh, I think there will be events probably in the evening. I think the people will use that Parthenon for weddings. I think they'll use it for uh, ch uh, children for school tours. We're going we're gonna to put a sign out in front that says, uh, for children, what do you think this is? And then on the back side, it'll say it's the Parthenon because that ratio of length to width is, you know, has gone around the world for centuries. And so then we want them to look at the Stonehenge and walk around inside that and see what, see if they can figure out what it is. And then the, the circle, which is the traditional uh, Indian meeting ground, uh, 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 there's a lot of history to that. And that all leads to the... Uh, the Carter windmill, which is the transition from ancient history to more modern history to this century and the fundamental change in uh, how we generate electricity and, and, and how life goes forward. So the, are those education on all of that? All of that will yes, be there? Yes, we'll have school children there. Uh, in terms of artists, I'm going to throw it open to everybody who wants to come out and, and uh, apply. Uh, I look forward to seeing... You know, Schools uh, send people, and commercial artists send people, and uh, amateur artists send people, and uh, generally uh, there's there's you know there's a, almost 50 of these blades to paint, and I'm uh, looking forward to expanding it, opening it up to everybody that wants to take a look at it. We're going to control it with a theme. The theme has to be sustainability and uh, renewable energy, but. Uh, uh, we have uh, no desire to uh, limit the number of artists who can come forward. And who designed the Parthenon and Stonehenge layouts? That well, we just copied what was historic. Uh, okay. Same number. That, there's a blade for every column that was in Parthenon. Uh, and then Stonehenge is a blade for every, every one of the rocks, which, of course, are irregular in their circle. 
And so it's to memorialize the shape and the height and then to give people when they walk inside some sense of, uh, of, of the uh, emotion you get when you go inside the real, right. the real place. And is the museum that's in the rendering, is that there or is that planned for this? Excuse me, sir? The museum that is in the... That's down the road. Where the next step is to, is to get a museum going. We have uh, lots of other artifacts. And over time, we're going to uh, get them out of the storage and uh, restore them and try to build this out into a, uh, something that's important. Because I said it before, but I'll say it again. It, it all started here. Wind energy was, uh, was kind of a joke. And we proved it here to be commercially viable. And the particular machine we're restoring is the one that made that case, and which, which is why I think it's important to okay. take it out, take it out yeah. of the garage and hook it up. Yeah. And, and just to confirm, there's not going to be a charge for people to go tour it and see. No, it. sir. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Those are my questions. So I'll just make some comments. I do, I do think it was unfortunate that the full thing was not presented to the Arts Commission ahead of time, and and I don't want to be dismissive of of their work and expertise in the process. And um, and I and they actually seemed very supportive of the project. In in some of the comments I read, they just didn't quite agree with how the process was. Um, and I don't want to dismiss them. I think this is one reason why it might be good to have a council liaison so it doesn't happen this way um, that they just get overruled. Um, you know, I do think this should be, I think this is the perfect location for it. And I think when you see like Desert X and you see site-specific artwork, it does celebrate our desert and, and the history and, and certainly in this case, the renewable energy, which is an essential tool and it's an educational tool. When I read the first arts proposal, it did look like 20,000 for the artists and the rest was just foundation. But in seeing the new, you know, seeing the latest, it does, it is an entire art project. Um, so I'm very supportive of this. What I would ask is that not just staff, but the Arts Commission be involved in the artist selection and, and perhaps the design of how the, you know, just, just working with the process through so it goes along and so we're not dismissive of them. But other than that, I mean, I love it and I think it was just the process um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to be dismissive of the um, Arts Commission, and, and I actually, before I was on council, worked with them on the street art bench project, and I think they could be very helpful in working on selecting artists that would go, th go through this process um, and any other design elements. So those are my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Holstich, go ahead. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Second. I have a friendly amendment then. Can I, I, mo I move to approve so long as the Public Arts Commission is involved in the selection of the artists and the design? I, I think the stipulation should be if they want to be involved. Their, their process is much different or could be different. So I think it's if the Arts Commission would like to be involved that, they, that we reach out to them. I don't think for the, as the maker of the motion, I don't think it's something we need to include in the motion unless that's your request. It might be an alternative one, but just asking that the applicant work with the Arts Commission and those members to have a public process for the arts portion of it. Uh, the uh, Art Commission has a rather uh, stringent uh, process for picking artists. And, and our vision is that we're going to open up school children. Who knows who it's going to be? We have to consult with them, but I don't think we should adopt their artist selection process. Uh, but we look forward to them helping us find people. Yes. Okay. So that, then, then I will just ask that they, that we, that our staff involve the arts commission in the process, and ideally, if the applicant will include them in selecting artists, or at least in reviewing and contributing. Uh, I think that would be that would be helpful, and also get them involved in the process going along. So I will move. I will go f with the original motion, and just hope that that happens. Thank you. Um, I have a question for staff. In terms of this project, why did it come before the Arts Commission before there were any renderings or, or final detail? It's clear that this project was not ready to be received by the Arts Commission. The applicant would need to respond to that. I think that they were on a timeline and they wanted to get their application in 
they did have the images of what they proposed the installation to be, but uh, perhaps that would be best answered by the applicant. They had a drawing that uh, of the basic design, the Parthenon and the Stonehenge, it just wasn't as well done as the one that came out later. But they they had they they saw the uh, the the, uh, the basic shapes uh, and, and and locations of, of those facilities. I see. So. The Arts Commission raised several points during their meeting. They also asked that the applicant work with them on those issues and then come back before the Arts Commission. Instead, the applicant asked for a yes or no vote so that they could then come and appeal to council. I don't feel that this is an appropriate response. It is important for us to follow the ordinances and the requests that we have in our commissions. Our commissions are doing really important work and they had legitimate questions. And this project should have gone back to the Arts Commission for that further review before coming to us. Uh, it's very disappointing to see that our Arts Commission was dismissed in this way and that their questions were not um, given more merit. Uh, and so just the process that was taken, I find very, frustrating uh, and I would like to see us work on making sure that in the future we're making sure that our arts commission is given the what they need to approve these projects and especially considering how many projects are in the queue that have not reached council yet that are waiting to be funded by small artists in our city and then this one is able to move fast forward to us. Um, so, Madam Clerk, if we can have the vote, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Council Member Hostage? Yes. Council Member DeHart? Yes. Council Member Middleton? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein? Yes. Mayor Gardner? No. Motion passes 4 1. Thank you. At this time, we will take a five minute break since our last item is likely to have quite a bit of conversation. Thank you.
We are back from our short recess, and we now turn to our last item on the agenda, just after 7.30, impressive. Uh, the last item on the agenda is item 3C, to request to add chapter 5.89 to the Palm Springs Municipal Code relating to sidewalk vending. Also an amendment to chapter 5.48 relative to commercial solicitation and amendments to chapter 6.15 relating to the regulation of mobile food vending vehicles. Can we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor and members of council, we have the sidewalk vending ordinance back on the agenda for your discussion this evening. By way of background, the sidewalk vending regulations come down to us from the state, as has been mentioned in public testimony in 2018, uh, SB 946 was adopted, which offers protections to sidewalk vendors, and then also establishes the parameters for local regulations. Uh, what it does allow is for both stationary sidewalk vendors, and so those who set up with tables or carts or racks or some other type of display, and then also allows for roaming sidewalk vendors. Uh, they may either be carrying products or pushing a cart or something along those lines. Uh, and both of those activities are to occur in the public right of way. The City Council considered a draft ordinance back in November of last year. Uh, keeping in mind, however, that we have two new City Council members uh, on City Council. Uh, there might be differing opinions than the direction that was provided to us in November. And so we're happy to listen to your comments and your, take your input this evening. Uh, but again, we uh, did have some direction in November and made changes according to that. Let me go ahead and just talk about one issue uh, that I think it's important to understand is that the sidewalk vending regulations apply to the public right of way. Uh, they also apply to public parks, plazas, uh, but I want to just mention public rights of way because this is kind of a critical issue in terms of uh, placement of stationary vendors. So in terms of the public right of way, it's not always clearly visible when you're there where property lines are or where the edge of the right of way is. Uh, generally, it's the back of the sidewalk. Sometimes it's several feet behind the sidewalk. And in certain cases, the sidewalk actually is on private property. Uh, and so it's not always uh, easy to distinguish where the right of way is. Uh, another thing to take into consideration is that sometimes we have very limited sidewalk area in our public rights of way. Uh, I'm showing you maps from East Ramon Road. This is in the vicinity of where the Home Depot and Lowe's are. In that particular area, the right of way is 100 feet in width. Uh, and then within that public right of way, we have uh, behind the curb only eight feet on each side. Uh, so going back to the previous image, there's only eight feet from the back of curb for sidewalk vendors to set up. Uh, and so as we get into the issue of the sizes of tents, that kind of becomes a critical element. Also, as we talk about uh, private property, we already have regulations in place in our zoning code which permit food carts and other similar displays on private property by approval of a land use permit. Uh, that's something that's been in the existence in existence in the zoning code for quite some time. Uh, and I'll confess that we haven't uh, processed many applications under that, but it is permissible to do basically the same activities that are allowed in the public right of way on private property upon approval of a land use permit. In terms of the requirements of what we're putting forward to you, uh, I'm going to go through these again. I know that we talked about these in November just for the benefit of our two new council members. Uh, stationary vendors are allowed in commercial zones, and when I say commercial zones, that includes industrial zones as well. Roaming vendors are allowed in both residential zones and in commercial and industrial zones. So roaming vendors can basically be anywhere in the city. Stationary vendors are limited to commercial and industrial zones. Another thing relative to location, what we're proposing is to maintain 48 inches of pedestrian passage. We had additionally recommended 72 inches. You've had testimony relative to that this evening. Uh, and so we have made that modification from what you saw back in November. 
There are also stipulations in terms of proximity to fire hydrants, bus stops, handicapped parking spaces, uh, driveways for police and fire stations. And again, that's in the interest of public uh, safety. Also, we have restrictions about corner visibility zones. Uh, I have had comments in terms of the language that we have in there. We would propose to simplify that to make it easier to apply for vendors as they're looking for spaces to locate. Uh, also, they cannot be within parking spaces, driveways, or block building entrances or windows. The reason for that is public safety, again, for uh, police and fire personnel to have visibility into businesses. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, specified is a separation from farmers markets and special events. Uh, the language in the state uh, law is in the vicinity of, and there is no definition of what that means. I had proposed 500 feet, but I've since been corrected and suggested that that should be much less. Uh, and so what you may have seen in public comment or in the letters that you've received is that should be much less than 500 feet and perhaps 50 feet would be the appropriate measurement. So again, that's something that city council can set. One of the things that was requested by code compliance is it does need to be a definite number because as I had mentioned in the vicinity of doesn't give anyone a clear picture of where they can locate. In terms of the cart or furniture that is utilized, we're proposing the following. Uh, stationary vendors can have a cart, a rack, a stand, or a display. Uh, we would also propose that they be allowed one umbrella or shade structure. Uh, here is uh, where I have suggested that an eight by eight easy up would probably be the most reasonable. The reason why I had suggested that instead of the more standard 10 by 10 model is because again, we have very constrained rights of way. Uh, a 10 by 10 easy up in most cases on a public sidewalk is going to encroach on private property. And so that creates an issue. There's less of an issue with an umbrella as it has typically a single pole that's supporting it. And as long as there's seven feet of clearance for the sidewalk, it's much easier to have an umbrella in those areas where we have a constrained right of way. Uh, now, when we're in a public park or a public plaza where we don't have the issues of ADA access or pedestrian congestion, uh, we could see a larger tent structure being appropriate. Another thing that we're proposing is that they be limited to one food preparation table or food cart and that they not have dining tables and chairs. We have also included language about signage. Uh, we didn't have language in the previous version. What we're proposing is that they be permitted the same type of signage that would be permitted for temporary signs under our existing sign code. And that would be one sign of 16 square feet or two signs of eight square feet each. Uh, because of uh, access issues, we're proposing that no freestanding signage be permitted as part of the sidewalk vending. Uh, we're also indicating that merchandise cannot be stored in the sidewalk area and then no electrical cords, gas lines, or water lines being permitted. Uh, these typically are tripping hazards and again, we're dealing with constrained rights of way. In terms of food related requirements, we are requiring that permits be obtained from Riverside County. Uh, they're in the process of developing specific regulations for sidewalk vending. They expect to have those available to the public in April. Uh, and so we're referring to their requirements for those vendors that would be selling food products. Um, we had had questions and comments from the public relative to the use of open flames and barbecues. Uh, what we have done is basically stated that they must adhere to fire code requirements. Uh, so those operations would not be allowed underneath a tent, obviously for safety reasons. And then relative to the smoke and odors that may be produced, we're referring to an existing section in the municipal code relative to uh, air pollution. Uh, and so they would be subject to those regulations just as any other business would. And then finally, we are uh, putting in requirements relative to not discharging water, grease, oil uh, onto the sidewalk or the street, uh, that all of those fluids must be contained uh, either by the vending cart or in some type of receptacle. 
One of the questions that I've had in our sidewalk vending ordinance is relative to trash receptacles. That is covered under the county's requirements, and so I haven't included that language in the sidewalk vending ordinance. One of the difficulties in including language from the county's ordinance is if it ever changes, uh, then we have to go back and change our ordinance as well. It's best just to reference it rather than putting the standard in there. In terms of the hours of operation, since you saw this in November, we since expanded it uh, to 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. in commercial and industrial zones. Uh, we haven't changed the residential zones. You've had a suggestion that in residential zones it be allowed from sunrise to sunset. We've seen that in other ordinances, so that would be an acceptable alternative if the city council would like to do that instead of having the hours of operation listed. Uh, then in commercial zones, we've also had a lot of comments relative to the fact that 12 a.m. may still be too restrictive. And so we would take direction from city council in terms of what you'd like to do there. As a general rule, bars are open until 12, uh, excuse me, 2 a.m. Uh, and so if you wanted to make that equivalent to the same hours as bars, that would be appropriate if you choose to do so. Uh, relative to public parks, we had proposed to uh, allow it in public parks uh, that are greater than two acres in size. Uh, one of the things that we would add to that is or by city council approval. Um, and then I wanted to just point out that even in the smaller parks, they'd still be allowed on the sidewalks adjacent to the park regardless. Um, and then we have language in terms of prohibiting that in parks where there's an exclusive concession agreement. Um, we have language where they're selling the same products. If they're selling different products, then I think it would be appropriate to allow that to occur. We've also had uh, uh, a comment relative to allowing roaming vendors in all parks, regardless of whether there's a concession agreement or not. So that's something that you could consider. In terms of the permit process, we are requiring a business license and then also a seller's permit from the Department of Taxation uh, and then any required county permits where there is food preparation involved, they would need to provide those uh, to the city upon obtaining their business license. Uh, we have eliminated any language relative to the provision of an encroachment permit or a live scan report or insurance verification. I will say that our attorney would recommend that our vendors have general liability insurance uh, it was mentioned in our previous discussion in terms of barriers to entry, uh, and so just take that under consideration as you look at establishing those requirements. One of the things that we have added based on public input, Mr. Espinoza had suggested to us, to allow the establishment of sidewalk vending zones. And so we've added language into the ordinance to allow city council to approve sidewalk vending zones by resolution. Uh, you might consider, again, something like a public plaza, uh, an area in a park. Um, we have the downtown park, which has an area on the east side of the park that was originally identified as a sculpture garden. That's something that may be used as a sidewalk vending zone, uh, but we would allow the city council to uh, determine those areas by resolution. As part of that, you may also relax certain standards in those zones as an incentive to locate there. Um, that could be anything from allowing greater tent structures, additional preparation tables, uh, expanded display areas, or things like that. Uh, because you are dealing with a larger space rather than a space that is constrained, uh, those types of concessions would be appropriate in designated zones. And so we are establishing a process for the city council to do that. We're not requesting you to do that this evening. I think that's something that would need some additional study and discussion, but certainly something that we would feel would be appropriate to consider based on the public input that we've received. We also have for you this evening proposed uh, revisions to our mobile food vending vehicles ordinance. Uh, that's quite a mouthful. I'm just gonna call them food trucks from here on out since everyone knows what those are. Um, in terms of your discussion at our November meeting, there was some direction provided relative to trying to provide some degree of parity between the sidewalk vending regulations and our food truck regulations. Uh, as I had included a table in our November staff report showing a comparison of those two, our 
mobile food truck uh, ordinance is in some ways much more restrictive than our sidewalk vending is. And so I think it is appropriate to consider revisions to the ordinance. However, this is a lot to take in all at once. And so what you may want to do is perhaps separate out uh, the mobile food truck ordinance as uh, an item that you may want to consider separately at a later point in time. With that, I'll just kind of go through these changes, giving you a little bit of background. And if you want to delay that discussion to a later point in time, uh, that is certainly more than appropriate. Looking at our existing ordinance and talking about restrictions, uh, based on some of the limiting factors that we have in the current ordinance, number one, that they are prohibited in the defined downtown area. And then secondly, they're prohibited on streets where the speed limit is greater than 35 miles per hour, that leaves a very limited area where food trucks may locate. And so I've got a number of maps showing here, and I apologize, this is at a very small scale. It's probably very difficult for you to see, um, but it just gives you an idea by looking at the red that's on these maps in separate areas that there's not a lot of locations for them to vend here in the city of Palm Springs. Now, we do allow food trucks on private property via a land use permit. We also allow them as part of special events, um, grand openings for businesses and things like that. But outside of those areas, as you can see, there's a very limited area where they could locate. Um, based on that, what we might do is think about expanding that um, by allowing the following, um, allowing them in the downtown area, but I'd recommend that we not permit them on Palm Canyon Drive just because, again, we have constraints in that area. There are safety concerns. There's also limited parking spaces there. What we might consider is allowing them on the side streets where it's a little bit less constrained. We could also consider Indian Canyon, allowing them on Indian Canyon. However, we may want to look at portions of Indian Canyon uh, there is a segment there between Baristo and probably Andreas or Alejo that, similarly to Palm Canyon, is somewhat constrained in terms of parking spaces and access. Uh, and so that's something that we'd need to look at. We would also need to look at any conflicts with Village Fest on Thursday nights and what we might do with that. We would also look at potentially allowing them on streets where uh, the speed limit is 40 miles per hour or under. Um, because we've made some recent changes to the speed limits, that would open up some additional area to food trucks where there are on-street parking spaces available. So again, just some things to consider in terms of locational requirements. Uh, we are proposing some other modifications to allow them in parks, uh, using the same language as sidewalk vendor, except where there's an exclusive concession agreement in place or they're selling merchandise that is different than what the concession would allow. We're also proposing to modify the hours of operation to be the same as sidewalk vendors. As with sidewalk vendors, you could also consider extending those hours longer if you would choose to do so. In the current ordinance, there is a limitation uh, by summer hours and winter hours. Uh, we would just make those year-round hours instead of limiting them as such. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I know there's a lot of information. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of comment. Uh, I don't think we would expect to finalize any ordinance this evening based on the amount of comments that we've had, uh, but we're certainly open to your questions and we'll take your direction as we move forward in the process. Thank you so much, Flynn. I really appreciate this. It's very comprehensive. And thank you as well. I know that at the last meeting we gave a lot of feedback and um, our, our deputy city manager, Flynn Fag, worked with Juan Espinosa, who is here um, who is an attorney and who's worked on this issue at the statewide level, so is very familiar with, with um, the law. And we really appreciate, Flynn, that you were able to, to talk with him and get his viewpoint as well, since we're so lucky to have somebody in our city that knows this forwards and backwards. Um, just also want to thank the organizers that are in the room who have been talking to street vendors um, on the ground. I think that's really important to make sure that we're getting those voices and to our restaurant and hospitality. I know there was a comment about um, engaging more with the community on this, but I do want to say we have received many, many, many comments from the hospitality community, from restaurant owners and, and others about this issue and as well as organizers. So we are getting a lot of comments and as um, 
we, we just heard this is probably not over tonight. We're probably going to have many more discussions, so there will be more opportunity um, to discuss this issue and receive public comments at length. And just a um, quick point of clarification for our Mayor Pro Tem. Did you wanna explain, or, well, I'll, I'll just say, are we, if we are going to be specifically discussing the downtown, then, um, no, and, Palm oh, I'm sorry, if we, are, if we do discuss really uh, down Palm Canyon in relation to food trucks, then um, Mayor Pro Tem will have to recuse. So I do ask that when we do get to that portion, if we are going to specifically be talking about food trucks potentially being on Palm Canyon, that we allow for Mayor Pro Tem to step out first. Um, that said, since this is a two-parter, if we can first take com uh, questions from council related to sidewalk vending only, and let's kind of fully discuss that if we can before moving to food trucks. So questions. And, and Madam Mayor, um, yes. just so you'll know, um, one of my colleagues uh, in the city attorney's office, Albert Maldonado, has been helping Flynn on this. So if we could allow him in on the Zoom so that he can uh, answer the, the Okay, great. Uh, great, and, th and thank you very much as well, um, Mr. Maldonado, for helping as well. I didn't say that earlier, so thank you. My do pleasure, thank you. Do we have questions from council on this? No. <laughs> Councilmember Middleton. Hi, I'll go ahead and start. I, I may have some questions later, but uh, let me start. Uh, Flynn, uh, the process that you're outlining uh, calls for a business permit to be uh, issued uh, to a sidewalk vendor. Uh, and will there be a fee associated with that business permit? Uh, yes, there will. It will be our standard business permit fee. And what's that fee? I believe it's approximately $69. All right. And what information is on that business permit? In terms of? Uh, in terms of who's taking it out, who actually owns and operates uh, uh, the business. Uh, we will request that information as part of the business licensing process, just as we would for any other business. And so they will need to identify who is the owner of that business. And the owner of, the, and I'm asking this line of questions because we have received certainly anecdotal information that the individuals who are frequently operating uh, the existing sidewalk vending uh, locations are not in fact the owners of, that pro of those products and of the, the materials, but that there is someone else that they are leasing them from. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, we would need the owner of the business to be identified on the business license. In the instance where a business owner might have multiple vending locations, uh, they would need to have separate permits for each location is what we are proposing. So we are identifying that there might possibly be multiple locations for the same uh, individual? They might have, for example, if they are selling uh, oranges, they might have three different locations in the city where they set up a stationary vendor location. And what processes will we have to ensure that we are in fact dealing, when we issue a permit, we're issuing it to the owner of the business? The standard process as we would with any other business license. So the, uh, there will be registration with uh, the Department of Tax? Yes, there will. And what will be the process for paying the tax? The business will be responsible for paying the tax. The city will verify that they do have that. So there will be an audit trail that will be required of these businesses to ensure that uh, all of the uh, funds that they receive are taxed? To the degree that we do that for other businesses, mm -hmm. keeping in mind in terms of staffing and the number of businesses that we have in the city, um, it would be difficult for us to audit all of them. Okay. So uh, the, these are uh, food vending uh, locations and in many of them there's food preparation. Uh, 
uh, do we have within uh, City of Palm Springs uh, public health responsibility or public health officials that uh, would do inspections of these facilities? The Department of Environmental Health, the County Department of Environmental Health would be responsible for inspections and permitting for food vendors. And do we have any experience with uh, the Department of Environmental Health in terms of the number of inspections they've done uh, to the existing facilities that are currently operating? I wouldn't be able to tell you that, unfortunately. Uh, so these are outdoor uh, facilities that uh, we don't know whether or not they've been inspected. Uh, when a restaurant opens in our city, uh, is there an inspection prior to their opening? Yes, there would be. Um, keep in mind, however, that we don't have a sidewalk vending ordinance in place yet. Right. We've been doing minor enforcement, if you will, uh, where we do receive complaints, we do have code compliance, visit the vendor. Uh, we can require a business license at this point in time, uh, as well as referring them to the County Department of Environmental Health. I, I think once we have an ordinance in place, we can be much more robust, robust in uh, our enforcement of the ordinance, as well as the county having their regulations in place. So if it's appropriate when a restaurant in a brick and mortar uh, location has an inspection prior uh, to opening for public health safety concerns, uh, why should there be a different standard or should there be a different standard uh, for a street vendor? I don't think that there should be a different standard, but again, we would leave that to the so Department of Environmental our, Health. So we could impose that there has to be a public health inspection before a facility opens that's going to be uh, doing prepared foods? That would be part of their licensing process with the county. We are requesting that they provide copies of those licenses to us. So before so they can get a permit from us, they will need to have a county yeah inspection that will demonstrate yep. uh, that, okay. Uh, as I understand it, uh, these uh, street, ven street vendors are not permitted to uh, be on private property without a land use permit. That is correct. Uh, can we an, impose a requirement that the business license and the land use permit be placed in a prominent location uh, on the uh, uh, street vending operation so that uh, anyone from the public would have an ability to know uh, that this is a licensed business and one that, has, uh, that is operating legally. Uh, yeah, I think that would be appropriate as we do require that of brick and mortar businesses to right. display their business license. Um, one of the issues with sidewalk vending is you don't always have a wall to tape it to or, or something like that. Certainly. So it would need to be on the cart or uh, whatever table or display they may have. Uh, but I'd recommend that they uh, have that available with them. So when we uh, opened up parts of Palm Canyon, uh, to the pop-outs, uh, allowing uh, many of our restaurants to expand. Uh, our first initial effort with those is we uh, pretty much made them open to just about anyone to, uh, to expand out. And we found that was not uh, an appropriate way to, uh, to deal with the aesthetics and with traffic uh, flows and move to a process whereby uh, we charge uh, a restaurant to be able to expand into what was public right away and impose uh, standards regarding uh, the aesthetics of what those uh, uh, facilities would look like. Is it appropriate if someone is going to use public right away that they should be charged uh, for the use of that public right away? and? Uh, subject to aesthetic standards as to how they look. I think there's going to be some difficulty in pursuing that based on state law and what it allows cities to adopt. Uh, I will defer to Mr. Maldonado if he has any additional comments in that regard. 
Thank you, Flynn. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so state law um, allows you to require the business license um, and you can impose a fee for that. Um, that's one way you can, you know, exact a fee for, for someone operating in that right of way. Another thing would be the options that were previously discussed, but I believe that a majority, at least of that council, there are different people on this council, but a majority of that council um, wanted to not impose a requirement for an encroachment permit. That would be um, another way that you could exact a fee for someone who wanted to operate within that right of way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a requirement that there be uh, that any food preparation uh, be subject to uh, uh, fire standards. So will there be an inspection in advance by the fire department to determine that uh, uh, these uh, facilities in fact meet uh, fire code? We haven't included that. That is something that you can consider. Um, there is a fee associated with fire inspections to be aware of. And again, as we look at barriers to entry, uh, that should probably be considered. So uh, one of the issues that this is going to present to us uh, is uh, enforcement of these rules. Uh, do we have any sense of what the staffing requirements are going to be uh, to enforce uh, these rules? And I, I say that very cognizant of uh, whether we go with 48 or some other uh, inch of requirements of right away we have ample examples of right of way being substantially blocked uh, today. Uh, and so there's a concern on the part of a number of residents uh, as to whether or not uh, uh, these uh, uh, street vendors are going to in fact meet code. So how many people are we gonna need to enforce this? I could not answer that for you this evening. We would be relying on our existing code compliance staff as well as the police department in terms of enforcement. Right. And as I understand it, state law does not give us the right to impose anything other than an administrative citation. Uh, what will be our recourse if there are multiple violations? Uh, can we have escalating citations? and what kinds of amounts would those, uh, those be? I'll defer that question to Mr. Maldonado. State law has two um, different administrative fine regimes. The first is someone who has gone through the process and has received their business license from the city. And if that individual has violated the terms of their business license that was issued to them, then a first violation can be penalized for a fine not to exceed $100 for the first violation. For the second violation, it can be a fine not exceeding $200. And for the third and every subsequent violation, they can each be a fine not exceeding $500. The second regime is if someone um, did not even get a business license and they're, they're operating completely illegally. In that case, a first violation, you could issue an administrative citation for a fine of no greater than $250 on the first violation. Second violation, you could impose up to 500 and the third and subsequent violations you could find them each time for up to $1,000. Uh, thank you, Madam Ch uh, Mayor. That's my questions for this time. Thank you very much. Is there another council member who has questions or? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so first question, if, if we're not requiring insurance, what would be the liability on the city? 
They were not. It's either Mr. Ballinger or Mr. Maldonado. Uh, Sorry. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with that. Um, no. You know, the insurance requirement is kind of a belt and suspenders. You know, uh, state law provides for immunities to cities uh, for uh, allegations of, of, um, of harm that result from the issuance of a permit, which is really the city's only uh, action in um, administering this program. So I think the city is protected um, to a large degree by those statutory immunities. However, we generally recommend that when people are operating within city rights of way that, that they get uh, insurance naming the city as an additional insured. And so that would be our recommendation in, for most cases. Um, however, we recognize that in terms of barriers to entry, um, these businesses are a little bit uh, unique. And so if the council chooses to not require that insurance, uh, we could certainly understand that. Okay, thank you. And. Um We've said that they can't block uh, windows uh, or entrances. And what about um, handicap ramps or bike racks or benches? We do have some language in there, but I think we would probably need to add those to the ordinance just to make sure it's clear. Okay, and are we allowed, I mean, is it legal to not, to restrict them from blocking another business's signage? Uh, I had this discussion earlier with Mr. Maldonado, and maybe if Mr. Maldonado could uh, provide the response. Uh, yes, Flynn. So if the city would want to impose that specific regulation, it would have to tie it to an objective health, safety, or welfare concern. That is to say, um, someone who wanted to frequent the business um, and they, they couldn't find the business because the, the sign was covered, um, that might be seen as only an economic reason to impose that regulation. And although I'm, I'm not 100% about this, my take is that reading the, the legislation provisions that say economic competition cannot be considered a basis for regulations that would be considered objective health, safety, or welfare concerns, that, that leads me to lean towards that the city may not be able to do that. Okay. Um, but if you can come up with an objective health, safety, or welfare concern beyond the economics, perhaps it could. Yeah. Well, I guess it may be some types of also informational or educational signage that you know, we had signs on our windows that said you have to wear a mask or something like that. So there may be something. I'm not, I'm just, that was more of a question. And um, uh, the next question, the difference between roaming and a stationary, they can, they're roaming if they only stop to do a transaction. That's that correct. Right? But if they're in a, let's say they're in, they're in a crowded park and they're constantly doing transactions, they can just stay there. Is that right? Technically, roaming means that they continue to roam, um, but you're right. If they are making multiple transactions, they're somewhat stationary. I think really the distinguishing difference is those who set up tables or racks, those aren't moved. But a roaming vendor will either have a cart, which can be moved easily, uh, or somehow is carrying the merchandise with them. Uh, I think that really becomes the distinguishing factor between roaming and stationary. Okay, and um, we don't have any restrictions on re restaurants can be 24 hours, right? In we don't. Okay, and the 500 feet that was in here from a, a permitted event, is that consistent with state law or? I, I've been told that it is not. Okay. Again, it goes back to Immediate vicinity. what the definition of vicinity is. Okay. I chose 500 feet because it's a similar standard that we use in the zoning code, and I like to have consistency between things. It makes it easier for us to enforce. Uh, but again, I've been told that we need to reduce that distance. Okay. And um, in this process, and I'm gonna ask, when, when somebody applies for a street vending permit with the city, is there someone in the city who helps them through the process and understand the guidelines? Or what, what are we doing to explain 
what the rules are before we start imposing fines? We don't really have anyone designated other than the team that we have at our business licensing counter. Uh, one of the things, and in fact, Mayor Pro Tem, you forwarded some information to me that other communities have done is they put together graphic brochures in both English, Spanish, and uh, other languages uh, to assist those who may be interested in having vending businesses. Uh, I'm working with our communications team to develop the same once we get to a point where we have solidified our own regulations, and so we would propose to do that as well. What we also might consider is engaging our community and economic development department in this process, uh, that perhaps they could also be involved in uh, assisting uh, sidewalk vendors in establishing their businesses. Okay, well I'm just gonna mention, as I have mentioned before, we need to have a business liaison for existing businesses, and I will mention that every time it comes up because there really is no one. Our economic development department is also our housing and our you know, homelessness, and they, they are spread thin and they're the they don't know uh, they don't work they don't actively go to the businesses I, and I should just am I okay to do comments now or just yeah. questions okay so I am going to address the comment that came up before that there should have been um, you know more more stakeholder or outreach and I know that I've had a lot of letters from both the business and hospitality community and and from um, uh, from the from the advo the advocates that are here today I will tell you it would have been very helpful for a lot of people to hear what they had to say and also what the business community and, and talk about, or the restaurant community, and talk about the concerns and what the state law is because there's a lot of perception here that this is something that we just decided to do on our own and, um, and there is also some misperceptions out there about what it's about. So I'm just gonna say that. I'm also gonna say that on the business license application that we do, and I've said this outside of this discussion, there is a lot more information that we should be getting. And, that, and we should have a robust database of our 30,000 business license holders that are out there. Um, so that, that's just another point. Um, I do wanna stay on, the health department is still developing what their plan is for this, so they're only doing a permit, but right now, as I understand it, there's no grading or follow-up inspections, is that right? No, there is not for sidewalk vendors. Okay, okay. So I, I, something that I would, you know, obviously health and safety is, is the main, uh, you know, concern that we have. Um, you put the limit on the, the 64 square foot tent as opposed to the 100 square foot. As long as they are meeting the other requirements in terms of access, does it matter to us whether it's eight or 10 feet? I suppose it doesn't, as long as they're not encroaching on private property and that they stay wholly within the public right of way. Yeah, I mean, it's just gonna limit more where they could be, but I will, as somebody who has had a lot of tents, I can tell you it eight by eight is not as easy to find. Um, so I, I would do that. Um, I am gonna mention I'd rather not discuss food trucks tonight, but because I think this is more complicated and there's a lot of questions that come up and I think we wanna get this right and, and do that. And that may involve stakeholder com conversation. So um, LA did something where they came up with a restriction that said you can't be within 500 feet of their walk of, their walk of stars, Hollywood. That sounds like you, there's no way to do that as it'd be in violation of the law, is that right? I guess I should ask. The attorney. Yeah, Mr. Maldonado, just by way of background, we do have the Palm Springs Walk of Stars on Palm Canyon and on some of our side streets. We've had public comment relative to uh, some type of restriction to prevent those from being covered by a sidewalk vendor. Uh, in your assessment, is that something that the city could regulate or do we not have the ability to do that? You can. Um designate some areas um, off limits if you can tie it to objective health safety welfare concerns i'll give you another example that um, los angeles has done city of ontario has done this as well around their event centers where they have big concerts on event days they have restrictions saying you can't be um, within so many feet of those places during the times of the event um, and they and they point to pedestrian traffic, vehicular traffic. So there's a tie there to objective health, safety, welfare concerns. Um, I will tell you that I'm aware that City of Los Angeles is currently being sued, testing that uh, 
very uh, regulation about the distancing between certain sites, including their um, their walk of fame. It's currently being litigated. Okay, <laughs> that's helpful to know. And I wasn't suggesting that we do the 500 feet. I was just sort of that came up to me from specifically from the chamber, not to have a food a vendor or merchant on top of one of the stars, but. If that's not allowed, it's not allowed. The and the 500 feet, it seems to me that if um, it's sort of de if there's a street closure that is causing crowds that are going to go through an area, there could be a safety issue. If it's not that kind of an, uh, I, mean, I don't know if we can make a difference. Is that possible to say on the type of uh, special event permit? Something like when you have you know Pride or something like that, where there's a whole lot of people and there's very limited access to it, it seems like it could be a safety issue versus a farmer's market where there's not really a safety issue and doesn't have to be 500 feet. I think based on the previous comments that we've heard from our attorney, where there is a public health safety issue, uh, we may be able to craft regulations to address that. Okay. Those are pretty much all my questions. And my, my comment is, just if I can say, you know, I actually... I believe in this idea of helping, you know, entrepreneurs and helping our, and, and local and small businesses doing it. And I, this is why I think sidewalk vendors are actually different than food trucks, which are not always local. But, um, but, you know, and I believe in helping them. I think this has been an issue that we've had in our city for a long time that we don't have somebody who helps our small businesses. And a lot of our brick and mortar are very, very small businesses. That that, you know, I know during the pandemic when. Councilmember Holstage was going door to door. There was really just single person businesses out there. So I, I, I want to help and support this. And I think this is the kind of thing that could be good for our community so long as we, we, we work with them and we help them and we listen to their concerns. My guess is that whatever happens with our first ordinance is going to end up being one of, we're going to want to update it in two years when we see what the real effect is. And that's probably going to happen in the statewide. Um, but I also agree with some of the comments earlier that these are often local residents. I would be concerned about corporations coming in. I don't think there's anything in the state law that prohibit, lets us prohibit that, but at least the permit process will let us find out whether that's there. Um, and evidence doesn't really show it's, it's happening. So um, those are some of my comments. I may have more, but I know I've presented a lot in advance of this. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Is there any other, oh, Council Member Holstage. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, and I really appreciate those points um, and agree with you. And I was brought to this issue actually first with uh, food trucks because I had been working with um, an organization that did the Coachella food truck park. And then we had been working on doing a Palm Springs food truck park. Um, and that organization helps local vendors who, you know, often are um, from communities where, you know, they don't have the startup costs to build a brick and mortar business out the gate, um, but are working on, you know, getting, and there's a lot of assistance to those businesses um, to get health and safety and permitting and go through the crazy bureaucracy that we require of people to open a business. Um, and I, I was trying to work with that organization to start a food truck park in Palm Springs for local vendors and businesses, and our ordinance didn't allow it. And even we were working on trying to do it in a park for the community, for families, and for people, and that wasn't allowed by our ordinance. And so actually we should think about how our ordinances are preventing entrepreneurship and businesses to start up. And I always strongly, I always sit here and stay, say, a rising tide lifts all boats. More people going to downtown to visit street vendors or to food trucks, et cetera, helps our whole economy. These are key parts of our economy. So thank you for saying that, because I very much want to take a positive approach here. I support your comments about um, supporting business owners and entrepreneurs in the city to start up and to go through the process because I'm a lawyer and I probably would have a very difficult time navigating all the permits. Like Flynn, I just learned if I hold a private party at my house on private property with a food truck, do I need a land use permit? You do not. Okay. But you do on private property if you are... If you are a commercial property, for example, a shopping center commercial. may want to have a food truck 
permanently in their lot, then we would do a land right. use permit. Right, like the Agua Caliente Band of Quia Indians often does a food truck event. They don't need a permit because it's tribal land. Correct. And every New Year's and different parties they do, they do food truck parks. So these things are already happening, and it is like a patchwork of regulation. Um, but I really appreciate what staff brought forward, and thank you to staff for working really thoughtfully, and thank you to our community partners. Um, really appreciate the work that these nonprofits are doing to make these laws work uh, for the community and street vendors um, who, who we want to help and support um, get, get up and running and continue their businesses. Um, I will try to just consolidate my question. So um, could you speak a little bit for hours of operation? So just like uh, you mentioned, we don't limit hours for other types of restaurants or other businesses. Bars are limited by state law because of the liquor license. Um, but can you just explain the thinking behind operating hours and limiting them till midnight, for example? Just trying to think of the impacts. Um, looking at some of the comments that we've had from members of the public, uh, where a commercial area is across the street from a residential area, there have been complaints about vendors, uh, some of the lighting, uh, some of the music that's played at the vendor station, etc. So just trying to be mindful of that. Uh, on the other hand, city council can determine what hours may be appropriate. Uh, and so you do have the flexibility to extend the hours. You could make them 24 hours a day if you choose to do so. Um, you just cannot be more restrictive than would apply to other businesses in the same block or the same area. And so that's really the guidance that we would need to use in looking at that, but also thinking about impacts to any adjacent properties. What are other cities doing in terms of limiting hours? Um, I quite honestly can't remember off the top of my head, and maybe Mr. Maldonado, uh, what have you seen in other cities in regulations that you've developed? They're, they're kind of um, broad ranging. Some are earlier than midnight. Um, I've seen some, I think at 10 p.m., I've seen some at 11. I don't recall um, seeing one that is past midnight, but again, you have the discretion to set however much time you would like. Thank you. Um, Obviously, a lot of street vendors operate in many, many cities and locations where they're open till 2 a.m. and get the people exiting bars. I may once or twice have been one of them um, buying some food on your way out. Um, so obviously, that's a practice. So some cities just they didn't limit it before, and then now cities who are limiting it are picking different hours, and that's just for the re the commercial and industrial uses, right? Um, because Correct. I do think I am worried health and safety about pedestrian safety and the safety of the vendors because we are a night sky community and we have very dark streets. So unless we're considering the impact and the lighting that might be needed to be seen um, for both, you know, kids and people who are using the, the street vending, um, I think that's important. Um, the park, so we exempted parks under two acres. That's just our downtown park, right? Uh, no, actually, we have a oh, couple of parks. We right. also no have health and wellness. Uh, no, actually, we typically consider health and wellness as part of Ruth Hardy. Yeah. So, which ones would it apply? The to? The other park that it would apply to is yeah. also the one at the intersection of Vista Chino and Gene Autry. It's kind of an unusual park, yeah. but it's less than two acres in size. The next park up in size is Baristo Park, but that's three acres, so it, they would be able to go in Baristo Park. So, but it would exempt the downtown park? Uh, yes, it's smaller than two acres. Now, what you may choose to do is to allow them uh, as part of a separate uh, sidewalk vending zone. So I really like the idea of a sidewalk vending zone as a way to, to work on this and to allow incentives and to get how this is working. Um, and I think the downtown park personally is potentially a good location to consider at least um, because we have a lot of unused space like on um, your block G and some of those walkways and the vacated streets, right? Uh, there might be opportunity there. So personally, I wouldn't like to exempt those smaller parks or at least do a, a sidewalk vending zone, but that's just a comment. Um, and then, so you just said that you're gonna change the language for the 500 feet. Um, 
for schools and farmers markets and other limitations to the state language that mm -hmm. is in immediate vicinity? It will put a foot measurement on that and per the direction of council, if you feel that 50 feet is appropriate, uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, right. One of the things I want to clarify, the 500 feet f is only for food trucks. We don't have that language in the sidewalk vending ordinance. The 500 feet from schools. Okay. So, so that only applies to food trucks and not to sidewalk vending. Got it. Okay. That's helpful because I think that's, there's many reasons why you would want vending, food vending near schools or other places where people are employed and have 30 minutes for lunch, things like that. Um, we got public comment um, from excluding vendors from using public infrastructure. Um, can you just explain what that would look like? So the limitation on using gas and electric, uh, water. We currently do allow um, the market, why am I blinking on the Village Thursday? Fest. Village Fest, thank you. Um, we allow Village Fest vendors to use our electricity on Palm Canyon, I think for free. So could you just explain the public benefit or the uh, health and safety considerations going into that? Uh, certainly with Village Fest, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I believe we do have a fee that is paid by the vendors which helps to recoup the costs in terms of the electricity that is used. Um, and so we have the issue of the cost of that uh, and who bears that cost. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of hookups with electrical cords, say for example, in the places where those are accessible off of street light poles, running the cord becomes a trip hazard across the public sidewalk, that's a concern. Um, hooking up hoses uh, to hose bibs, again, tripping hazards. That is the primary concern, is the safety issue, uh, and then who bears the cost of those utilities that the city is providing, and is it done in a fair and equitable manner? Thank you, that's helpful um, to understand. Let me just review my notes and see if I have any other questions. Um, one that uh, Mayor Pro Tem raised about the county. So typically the county is the one regulating public health for restaurants and those types of businesses. So we see they rate businesses and they have a whole department of public health. So do we know where the county is currently on creating a program for this and their regulation of these businesses? Yes, they do have draft regulations which uh, they are getting ready to release. They expect to adopt those regulations in April. So that should be coming very shortly and should dovetail with our sidewalk vending program. So will that apply to us unless we choose our own ordinances and rules? Uh, yes, it will apply to us. And one of the things in discussing with the county, we can be more stringent than they are, but obviously not less stringent than they are. Right. And so that's my question is, and is any of this that is in our ordinance or our permitting process, is it duplicative? Are we requiring permits that the county is going to require permits for? Are we enforcing that the county health department really should be enforcing? That's not our up our alley in terms of expertise, right? Correct. No, we don't want to be duplicative and we don't want to do the job of the county either. Uh, that we will defer to the county in terms of issues of food safety. Um, one of the things I wanted to back up and say, and now I lost my train of thought on that. Um, oh, if we adopt a separate standard that's different than the county relative to food safety, they won't enforce it. Right. They will only enforce their own standards. And so if we do adopt a more stringent standard, it would then be up to us. I will caution that our code compliance officers or our police department staff probably are not trained to do that type of enforcement. Right. Uh, and so I wouldn't want to put that on them if we were to adopt a more stringent standard. So should we wait to, I mean, I think it's clear we're not approving anything tonight and this is just a discussion, but so have you seen drafts of that ordinance? Should we wait and see and see how it will interact with this proposed it, ordinance? Yes, I think they should have that available quite shortly as I had indicated in the month of April. Uh, and so that will help to inform some of our decisions that we make. Uh, again, knowing that we're not going to get through this discussion this evening, uh, we do have some time to dovetail our process with the counties. 
Thank you. And then one, one question we got asked is the inches for the ADA and what's required. And I know state law also says that we're required to follow the ADA. So could you just speak to that? Or I also asked the city attorney, um, you know, you had 72 inches and then this is 48 inches. And then there's public comment that it should be 36 inches. Certainly. And I'll, I'll apologize to Mr. Espinosa. We may have a difference of opinion on the distance. Uh, the required width for ADA is 48 inches. It does allow an exception where there are vertical obstructions in the public right of way that it can be less. And those vertical obstructions would typically be light poles or street trees or things of that nature. Uh, and again, I think we might have a difference of opinion there, but uh, that's the direction that we've had from our uh, building and safety uh, director as well as from our attorney. Thank you. And that's the standard we use for when we did ADA access around our signage, things like that. We actually have uh, a greater standard for our signage for our A-frame signs. Right. We require 72 inches of uh, pedestrian access room Got or it. space. Um, okay, and then last question about the fines. So the fines are in state law. Um, and did we adopt that or do we adopt a different fine structure than is actually in SB 946? And again, I'll defer to our fine expert, Mr. Maldonado. Thank you. Um, we adopted the identical language from state law. So the, um, the, the tier structure that I outlined earlier, that is what you have in your draft ordinance. Um, I do know that there were some public comments asking for reduce fines, you have that discretion um, to set fines at a lower amount. I see, so state law sets that maximum. Correct, a fine not exceeding, that's their language. So you can set a fine lower than the amount set in state law. Great, thank you. I don't have any other questions, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I have some things unless Councilmember DeHart wants to go at all. You can go. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much again. I really appreciate all the work that's being done on this and the comments that are, have been shared. Um, do we have any parks that have an exclusive concessionaire? We have uh, two parks that do have concession agreements. Um, DeMuth Park is one of those, and then the stadium facility in Sunrise Park both have concession agreements. Um, there is some question whether or not they are exclusive agreements. Uh, they are for limited terms and only during certain events. Uh, and so in terms of our application of this ordinance, what we might do, and I think there might be flexibility in terms of the agreements that we have, is that when those concessionaires are not open and operating, that the park would be available for vendors. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with the vendors at, at both. Um, but at least for the stadium, right, it's contained within the stadium in you go inside to watch the game. So if there was somebody at Sunrise Park way on the other side where the playground is, to me that doesn't seem like a conflict because the people who are playing on the playground are not going to the ball game. There's a separation there. Um, the same thing for Duluth Park, the, the location of where the concessions is located for the ball games is real is like on one side of the park and on the very other side there's a, a whole side. I mean Demuth Park is our biggest our biggest park. Um, so I, I don't feel like these are issues and so I would love to be able to see that we don't um, unduly restrict uh, things there even if there is an event going on instead of just say hey within a certain distance we're not competing because I do understand that at the Demuth um, you know, we, we, I would go to watch my brother play ba baseball. And so you, there is usually hot dogs, things like that, which are similar items that the food vendors could be selling. So I do, do want to be cognizant of that. But um, if it's in separate space, I think it's fine. Uh, in general, I want this to be a positive <laughs> thing for our community. And I, and I think, you know, Mayor Pro Tem and I were talking with the hospitality community today, and there there were a lot of misconceptions about what what can be allowed and what can't be. And this is state law, and this is us trying to make sure that we're we're uh, reckoning with the state law and doing something that can be positive. Um, 
and, and making sure that we don't have ADA issues, right? We, we have seen that. I have seen that as well. And, and, and we can't have that continue because it is a hazard. Um, so, but instead of being overly punitive, I want to be able to do some outreach to the, to the folks who are who are vending and make sure that we are explaining to them what the the rules are um, and not just finding them um, too quickly. Because I think again, people are confused on all levels on what they're allowed to do. So I think I'm sure there are vendors who think that they're perfectly within their rights, but they just don't realize that there are other things like ADA or um, something else that might be. Um, they might be in violation of. I'm supportive of the sunrise to sunset in residential neighborhoods and open until 3 a.m. in commercial. I agree. I think when going to Los Angeles or the other big hubs for, for gosh, you know, how many decades there's been vendors outside uh, clubs and places. And it's great to know, too, I think that people are getting something in their stomach after having had drinks, um, regardless of whether or not they're driving, they shouldn't be driving, but they should still eat something. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't, and again, it doesn't compete with our standalone businesses, our restaurants. We don't have restaurants other than I think some, other than McDonald's and Del Taco that are open 24 hours <laughs> or past midnight. Um, and I would just ask that we make sure that we're using plain language in our and any ordinance that does come forward, I think that often causes some confusion and even minor things like 64 square feet for the tent instead of saying it's eight by eight. I think little things can cause some people to be confused about what's being said. And I think that goes the same for when we're talking about parks that are under two acres. I, I would have guessed that Baristo Park was under two acres, but I'm just hearing that right now at this meeting that it's over two acres. So I don't think that people really know. So that would probably not be within the ordinance, but you were talking about making that pamphlet of information. I think there would, it would be great to see things like that that are in our ordinance just listed out clearly so people understand the limitations um, in, a, in an easy, easy way. Uh, and the, I, and I think 50 feet from the markets events, I think that makes sense. I understand your desire to have a set uh, number to make it easier for enforcement. And that and I, that I appreciate because I think that when you just say in the surrounding vicinity, it's so um, subjective that then you have issues with um, potential harassment or potential um, conflict, right? That we don't we don't want in our in our city. Let's see. The other question I had is, do we know if anyone that's selling on some of these empty lots has um, a land use permit? I, I would guess that they do not. Um, while I'm not directly involved in planning processes the way I used to be, um, I don't believe uh, there's a couple of ones that have been mentioned to me that I don't think that they have a land use permit. Okay. So, I mean, they've some of these have been operating for a while, so it's possible that the landowner either doesn't know or does, isn't bothered by it. But again, this is to me an opportunity to be able to engage people in being, in being compliant and not just um, simply fining or shutting people down. Um, I would really like to see um, us assisting in this in any way we can. I, know, I understand that um, Revolution Carts is working on different carts that people can purchase that are um, that work for these ordinances, so that people would actually know that they're in compliance with state law and that they had their card and things like that. So I think being able to point people in the direction of resources that are available would be useful. Um, and I do agree with Councilmember Holstage about setting up an area where people could do some of the street funding because it looks like many of the folks that are set up in bigger segments in our streets right now um, don't necessarily even fall under the sidewalk vending or um, ordinance on the state level, right? They're out of, that's not in, under that compliance. So we, we have kind of, it, we have sidewalk vendors that fall under that state law, and then we have some other businesses that are actually outside of that 
that realm. Um, and we want to make sure that those folks understand that they aren't underneath this and how they can become underneath the state law and eventually under our ordinance, um, the health and safety standards that are being recommended. All of that makes sense. And I do agree with Mayor Pro Tem and, and the, that we need a business liaison or somebody that's assisting. And, and I do, again, I wanna just say that the pamphlet that you're talking about to very clearly distinguish um, what's needed and what's required, I think is, is really important because it is confusing. Just reading the staff report and seeing this license and this other license, it's confusing because I don't know where to get any of those licenses. Are some of those from the city? Can I get all of them at the city? Yeah, I, I think there's just so many and we want to, again, this is, we're talking about businesses that make very little money um, so we don't want it to be overly burdensome for someone who's just trying to sell <laughs> a few things. I mean, again, it, the, this sort of vending has been happening in our city forever. Um, the most, I think the, the classic sidewalk vendor is the Palatero, the ice cream man pushing his cart throughout neighborhoods or in parks. And I, mean, I think if the ice cream man suddenly disappeared from our parks, I think we'd have a lot of parents who would be just outraged by that, right? Because these are, these are um, businesses that we've come to rely on and really love and are part of our, our culture and our, and our community. So there is, um, I think, some, some misconceptions that are being kind of thrown around uh, when, when really this is overall a positive thing for us. So I'll leave it at that. Councilmember DeHart, do you have comments at all about this? Okay, go ahead. You're gonna have to explain to me your la the, the last uh, thing you were talking about. Some qualifying mm -hmm. in this area versus somebody qualifying over there. I wasn't following you there. Yeah. Um, so in order, from my understanding, if you are a sidewalk vendor, you have to be, you're only under the ordinance if you're a mobile vendor, if you have a kind of a standalone shop, but it's not for people who have all their cooking apparatus out there. Is that correct? If you're setting up propane, you're setting up all of these items for cooking, that doesn't fall under the sidewalk vending ordinance under or law under the state, right? No, it, it may fall it under might. state law as long as they are in the public right of way okay. because there is no local limitation in terms of the number of tables or items that they may have as part of that vending operation. Um, it, typically with those larger operations, though, what you see them is they're encroaching on private property, and I kind of assume that's what you meant is that they're on private property instead of in the public Got right it. of way. Okay, so then, yes, that would be the distinction then is yeah. they're – they're not allowed because they're inhibiting ADA access or private property. Yeah, and you know they could be permitted if they had a land use permit more on private property. Right. So even with the multiple tables and things like that, there is a way for them to get permits. It's just that they're most likely not wholly within the public right of way, and that's kind of the issue. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you know, I. Huge shout outs to, uh, to uh, council for our support of the street vendors and sidewalk, ven or sidewalk vendors, the roaming vendors. Um, I think it, uh, it goes, uh, we certainly want to support and show um, any kind of open door that we can for uh, micro business opportunities and our hardworking individuals that that are, are trying to, to make ends meet and um, their um, uh, entrepreneurial skills uh, um, allow them to go out and set up one of these um, uh, vending stands. Um, but I, we got to keep in mind, this isn't just food. So um, a sidewalk vendor could be selling merchandise, and that merchandise right now is not defined. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I think we should define merchandise, um, and, and unless they're in the law, uh, people selling counterfeit goods um, are already prevented from selling counterfeit goods um, 
you know, you go to some places and they lay the, the, the blanket out on the ground and all these purses are out there or sunglasses or watches. Um, so I, uh, it, 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 is there a law against selling counterfeit merchandise? I'll defer to the attorneys on this one. Thank you. There, Jeff, I think you may have found something. Is, is there not something in the penal code? Um, I don't think there's anything that uh, our city code enforcement officers enforce. For instance, you know, a brick and mortar, I don't think we're, we're actively engaged in, in um, enforcing uh, sales of, of, of counterfeit goods, no. Mm -hmm. So like uh, adult products, um, you know, I, I, think, I, I think merchandise just needs to be defined. Can someone be out selling porn DVDs? Um, you know, what, what is the merchandise that we're going to allow? We're spending a lot of time talking about food, but we're not focusing on that other single word that is in here about merchandise. So I think we need a little definition there on merchandise. Um, I want to, uh, in cu public comment, there was a couple of statements that I, um, I would just want to point out because they, they, they're not accurate. Um, it, it's, um, uh, they're... The, this draft ordinance uh, is not citing unsavory characters that would be selling near schools. Um, and that was the reason for a prohibition of uh, 500 feet. Um, that could have been something old, but today it is not in this ordinance. Um, and, and we do not require the live scan. Live scan is not part of the draft proposal that we've got before us today. Um, so I think those are two important um, you know, um, comments that were made earlier that we need to point out that uh, aren't included. Okay. It, just Council Member if I can just um, say those were in the last ordinance before council the last time, which is why those were raised. But yeah. you're right, they're not in this one. So they're not in what we currently have before us. And the other word, I'm, I'm really concerned about the word vicinity. And, you know, I just, um, I just typed in, in um, lawinsider.com. There, there has, is there not a, a definition that the state is using for vicinity? Um, no? Not that I'm aware of. So here it says, vicinity means being near and not remote, but does not have to be adjacent. It does not have to include sites that are miles apart, but it may include sites that are adjacent to each other, across the street from each other, or thousands of feet away from each other, but in the same general area or proximity. Um, now... I, that was my understanding that I, when I'm looking at vicinity, specifically talking about um, the distance from permitted events. Um, having gotten comment from uh, a number of our event organizers uh, and even you know our the city's events, um, it, there's a lot of concern that if we if we use any measure that 500 feet isn't enough um, because of the public, the parking challenges that, uh, that come from uh, our very busy uh, uh, events that are permitted by the city. Um, and, and we only have a few areas, but uh, Palm Canyon, um, uh, either McCormick Car Show. If you look at the, 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 the space around the McCormick Car Show, a um, lot of uh, congestion, a lot of cars, a lot of vehicle traffic. Um, so 500, the, the general feeling is 500 isn't enough for those permitted events. And uh, we, we should be looking at something more like 1,000 or 1,200 feet. Um, and, and that would pull, that would uh, get rid of the public safety issues on Indian Canyon during Village Fest night, for instance. Um, and that was a, that's a big concern on, um, you know, creating a Village Fest on Palm Canyon and then creating opportunities for another Village Fest, a free market, to happen on Indian Canyon. And that would just add to uh, incredible safety concerns and, um, and, and um, parking issues. So that, that's um, the use, the, the vicinity uh, distance in, in that application with regard to the event space is something that I'm concerned about. 
Um, uh, I mentioned uh, the we we talk about the the vendor is going to have a decal, um, but uh, and I've since learned that that decal is something that um, is thought to be issued by the health department. But I would like I think that needs to be uh, we need to add that definition so the folks understand that the decal is coming from the health department or or whatever that instrument is, um, is is coming from the health department and both for the roaming vendor how is the roaming vendor identified um, that they have the proper health permit um, you know I, I, I think uh, if we're if the street vendor the the sidewalk vendor is going to have identification how does that roaming vendor tell the consumer that they're the, the health department has approved what they're doing. They've gotten their food card. They've done everything they're supposed to do. So uh, that's not clearly identified here. Um, uh, and I, I think we need to identify that. Um, and the other one, uh, f Flag, I'm sorry if you, you said it in your review. We don't have mention of uh, food service wear, um, disposable and combustible um, uh, service items, uh, recyclable containers. I, I think we need to add that in here also as a reminder that this is an ordinance within the city. Uh, so um, folks that are doing sidewalk sales um, understand that, that this is something that the city um, uh, um, finds very valuable and we're, uh, we want to focus on sustainability. Um, I think uh, um, when we look at um, the hours of operation, um, you know, we're not a we're not a twenty four hour city. We're not L A. and we we go to bed very early. Uh, so I, I think the the later we go, if we don't have um, if if we don't have some kind of restriction, or not restriction, if we don't have some kind of time window, um, we're putting our vendor street vendors into a situation where um, in early morning hours, um, when we don't have other businesses open, um, that is a concern. Um, so I'm not sure 12 a.m. is the right number. I, I don't think. 2 a.m. is, uh, most of our bars, there's, uh, I think we probably can, I was trying to count them, uh, are serving food. So, um, you know, other than liquor stores, um, you know, there's, there's only um, a handful, uh, maybe a 10 or 12 that um, don't have food service. Um, so I, I, the timing is one that I, I, I think we need to continue to look at. Um, uh, identifying when something is uh, is abandoned. Uh, so when is it considered uh, a location um, uh, is um, the is an abandoned station? Uh, so that unattended equipment, um, you know, at at what point does that be considered uh, abandoned equipment? Uh, I think we need to have that um, that here so uh, so everybody knows. Um, I. Um, we've talked about the square footage um, for the the, the pop-up tent. Uh, my greater concern is we're not defining or we're not letting people know how much space they can use. So, um, you know, if we have a, a, a sidewalk vendor, they don't know that they can go to be 20 feet wide or they can, um, you know, use a pop-up tent, um, I, I think we need to be a little more explicit in our definition, or maybe this is where the diagrams or the pictures may come in that shows somebody, here's the space that you is, is uh, every vendor is allowed to use, this is what it looks like. So they get to see um, uh, the table right next to the pop-up tent. Uh, they get to see the umbrella wherever that might be placed. Um, uh, and the placement of the chairs. So I think the photograph or the graphic to be able to show that, uh, to make it easy to understand is, uh, is a very positive thing. And regardless of the health department's requirement on trash, um, or if it's required by the health permit to include a trash receptacle, um, uh, I think we should 
point out that we want our street vendors to help us keep the area clean. So we want them to have a trash receptacle and, and we want them to be good neighbors. And when they're done selling, that, uh, that they look around and they, they clean up any trash that may be around them. We do mention that in the uh, food truck uh, ordinance, but we're not mentioning it in the street vendor ordinance. Um, so I, I think um, adding that there just helps people understand what the expectation is, um, and that's not an undue uh, burden that we're placing on them. Um, uh, I think the fine structure, uh, I, I certainly would support uh, council's uh, direction on uh, if there's support to adjust the fines. Um, you know, do, we don't have to follow the state guideline on these maximums. So it is, uh, you know, to, to, to be more um, uh, accessible for more vendors um, and to not put a strain on, on folks. Uh, I don't see a reason why we can't have lower fines than what the state is, is allowing us to have there. Um, and I think um, that is it for me on street vendors. Thank, Thank you, you. I appreciate that. Yeah, just to, and I just want to clarify one thing. As a person who does not go to sleep early, <laughs> and likes to go out. Um, you can't find food other than Del Taco or McDonald's after 11 p.m. Sometimes Black Book stays open past up until midnight, but they're for their kitchen sometimes, but not always. So it's 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 the couple. Fa well, Casa de Neda says well, it's 24 hours, but seriously, there's <laughs> there's nothing. Um, the bars the bars close their 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 food their food really early. Um, generally 11, sometimes earlier. Um, so just wanted to clarify that. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple questions. I remember at one point when people were using the electric downtown, we, were we able to turn it off at a certain point outside of Village Fest? I don't know if we were able to turn it off at a certain time. Um, I believe that we have locking covers on those that we apply to them. We, so outside of Village Fest, they can't. Yeah, we have the ability to lock or unlock those, I believe. There actually was a health and safety issue not related to food vendors when people were using the electric at that time. So I just wanted to mention that. I know there's a difference between the, what, the interpretation of the 48 inches versus 36 inches of ADA access, and I actually was also thought that might be too little given sometimes there's crowds in front of them. Can we, can we require that they just, the, it's the food vendors or, or, or merchandise vendors' responsibility to ensure that if it's, they still have the access through there? Like they, if there's a crowd of people, they create a line or is there any way to do that? We can certainly write that into the regulation. It becomes a little bit difficult to yeah. enforce though. It's probably more of a guideline then. Yeah. I would encourage my fellow council members and other people to look at L the LA, even though I know there's things that are, there's being sued for, but on their website, they actually present it very positively and they have really good, nice brochures on there. They actually put them in like 15 languages and they are very easy to read and understand. So I would just encourage them to look at. Uh, to comment one thing, the mayor said, you said sunrise to sunset. I think it probably should be half hour after sunset, mm -hmm. especially in the summer. People go out after the sun goes down. Yeah. Um, so I would say that. Um, uh, I do uh, want to mention one thing about uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member Middleton's about being current on sales tax. As a normal business, you're required to be able to have your resale certificate and your business license and other permits there handy. So. I think the simple way to make sure somebody's paying their tax is just they would have to have a, their a current resale certificate with them. Um, I mean, as a as a other business, they know where you are, and if you don't pay your tax, they they do send you all kinds of notices. So that that seems a way to make sure that they're current and not not an issue. I also do agree with with lowering the fines, especially as we start this process to make sure they do it. We work with them, and this is something that we may have to analyze in a couple years. 
Um, I share council member uh, DeHart's concern when we have large events that 50 feet might be too close. So I just want to mention that. Um, and, and I very much agree with council member Holstage on having parks for either street vending or, or food trucks or places where there is not a lot of other food and, and actually working on ways to promote these businesses in a way that actually helps, you know, helps the residents and helps you know, show what they can do and also helps obviously the, the vendors and the merchants um, get into that. And we've seen and not aggravate you know, anybody. I think that there's a way to make it very positive and helpful. And we've actually seen in our city a few really successful businesses start out as mobile. Or, you know, we have Gambino's Creperie and Hay Day Burger and Towny Bagel started in the farmer's market. And so there is real potential here. And, you know, it's, 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 we could have more of that. So those are my last comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Oops. It are, well, if we have other comments, we can make them. But I do want to just point out, it sounds like we've got a lot of different views on the dais. Um, obviously, <laughs> so uh, I would ask staff when we are bringing this forward, if there are kind of points of disagreement that we're seeing, if that can somehow be del you know, delineated in the staff report, I, I think it would just be helpful to understand where there's points of contention. So then maybe we can focus in on those at a later date to be able to really know where we're where we're aligned and where we're not. Councilmember Holstage. Thank you. I was going to try to do some of that now, but I don't know how far staff wants us to go and what you need from us, but just hearing some votes. Um, I also agree with the sunrise, sunset, but 30 minutes maybe before and after. We have such a strange sunrise, sunset here because of the mountain, and it's often light for extended periods of time after. You might so. People smarter than me can do that, but I agree with that. Um, I also, um, I heard three other votes for uh, reducing the fines and lowering the fines, so I would like to see that too. Um, I'm interested in the large events, um, you know, and how that works in practice, just more information. I don't know if I have enough information here. I just went to Disneyland. I left Disneyland. There were, like, hot dogs and, like, really good food you could buy that was not $20 in crappy Disneyland food. So I know this already happens at Dodger Stadium. I mean, this has been happening for large events for decades and decades. Like, there's already a model. We don't have to recreate it. Um, but I would like more information on that before I support. But I do think, like, a 50-foot is pretty reasonable for for most things, because um, that's immediate vicinity, and that's what the state law says. Um, and I think if we go beyond, I mean, state law requires that. We can't go beyond that, right? Immediate vicinity, we can't go beyond to Correct. require, we couldn't require 1,200 feet if we wanted to. Correct, whatever immediate vicinity is. <laughs> right, so our hands are sort of tied on that issue. Um, and then I heard at least three people express for allowing sidewalk, exploring to allow sidewalk vending zones where we might have um, areas where we could enable and support. And, you know, Palm Springs, we always like to get it right. We always like to do our own thing. We always like to be a model for the community and for the nation. And I love the idea, you know, so many cities are taking this to be a negative. Um, but I really like the idea of, like I said, this is a pipeline for um, entrepreneurs and for businesses. And so um, supporting that pipeline with business support and city support is such an amazing opportunity. Um, so I would like to see that. Um, I was taking notes on what everyone said, and I do have a more comprehensive list, but I'm going to need a minute. Um, but those are the things that I heard at least majority support for. So please feel that free to add. Thank you. I think I think that is correct. Um, while you do that, Councilmember Holstage, so we do have the food truck item before us as well. I have heard from a couple people already that maybe they're not quite ready for full discussion on that item. Um, but does anyone have any general comments that they would like to give to staff to inform for the next time this item may or may not come before us? And if you don't want it to come back to us, please say that as well. Can we I, don't want staff to do more work if there's not support. Right. Can I ask Mayor a some question? So just to be clear, the food truck does not, there's no state requirement to do anything, to allow anything. No, there isn't. Okay. So um, 
So we can, whatever restrictions we've had, or if we want to change them, and so if we can say that we don't want it to hurt existing businesses, there's nothing wrong with that. Correct. Okay. All right. So, so then I think this does need a, you know, a bigger discussion because there may be certain areas like, you know, parks where it does make sense. Um, but I think that for something like this, then you, we really have to engage the business, the restaurant community, especially, I guess, I guess there are, I, I, I guess we're not talking merchandise trucks. So food trucks, I do think we have to, you know, hear from them because those are the, you know, they are an important part of our, our economy and, and they're often residents who live here and pay, you know, hire people and follow the guidelines and food trucks are not necessarily, although I do love food trucks, just I think we want to protect our businesses. So I think in this case, we might want to have another discussion if we need to change the current ordinance, and I'm, I'm not even sure we do. Um, Councilmember Middleton. All right, thank you. Uh, I support uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bernstein's comments that uh, when it comes to food trucks, we are not obligated by state law that gives us greater discretion, and I would very much want to engage uh, our restaurant community that is such a fundamental, uh, important part of Palm Springs and the heritage uh, of our community. Uh, as regards uh, street vending, uh, I can count and I can see where we're going. Uh, I'm not going to be in the majority on uh, this issue. Uh, I hope once again that I am proven wrong, but I think we're making a terrible mistake and we're compounding the terrible mistake that was made by the California State Legislature. Thank you. Um, in regarding food trucks, um, one of the things that I learned tonight is that apparently food trucks are not allowed outside of schools and that would be one thing that I would want to change and just find out when that happened because I think uh, like the comment that we heard I I grew up going to school here in Palm Springs and um, we had the ice cream truck right outside of our school um, and also the ePels truck and ePels is very beloved and then so it's I, I actually did not know that our school children don't get to have the ePels truck outside of their schools anymore that's a bummer as so I do uh, would like to be able to find out how we can support those types of, yeah, go ahead. Just Brian. one comment. There is a, um, a provision in the food truck ordinance that states where the school has specifically permitted them mm -hmm. that okay. food trucks can be there at a school property. So, so then do we have them still there at some schools? Or I, do we just don't know? I don't know, to be quite yeah, honest. I, I don't have an elementary aged or middle school or school aged child, so yeah, I don't know. I, I drive by <laughs> Kawia on a regular basis and I've Never seen any trucks outside no, of Kuya Elementary. I haven't either. Um, interesting. No, I mean, and things change. Obviously, things change. I went to school very long time ago. Um, but but I am interested in kind of how we can expand um, the reach of food trucks, but also, I think, get away from this uh, Palm Springs doesn't support food trucks attitude. Because when you look at the current ordinance on the books, there's actually lots of places that food trucks can go in Palm Springs, but we just never see them. And I think it's partly because we are, there, there was this, there's this impression that we don't allow them just in general, but really it's that we don't allow them in our downtown. Um, so I just would like to be able to dispel that because it's, it's possible that we don't really need too many changes to our food truck ordinance, that we really just need to say, hey, you're welcome in these areas, um, and we encourage, and or even encourage it a little bit. Um, one of the things that you know we talked about once, I think in one of my very, very first meetings on this council, was that here around City Hall, there's nothing to eat. And while our meetings are getting shorter, uh, there were many times when our our um, chambers were packed with people and they would be here all evening with us uh, and there was nowhere to step out and just grab a quick bite. And how cool would it be if there was a food truck at City Hall during our meetings? And remember, there are <clears throat> restaurants in our city who have food trucks or have the ability to come and have a, and sell their food in that way as well. So it's, it's not just 
these standalone businesses that could be existing businesses in our city who create this mobile um, um, option as well. But there are, and I would love to just see food trucks come to City Hall in general for our employees who are working really hard and um, have trouble running out to get food, especially during season. Are they not able to come now? They, they, I think they, I think they can, but it's just that we have this reputation as being not friendly to food trucks. I, I, I um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the the food vending. Uh, uh, I'm very concerned that uh, does it need to be changed from where it is today? Uh, so I. I uh, certainly would like to proceed cautiously on on that. People can sell in Palm Springs, so it may be more of a messaging um, to let people know that, that they can. And, you know, we've got a lot, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that if they know a buck is to be made, they would be outside City Hall um, capturing, you know, those sales. So and maybe it may be more of a PR thing. Uh, I, I needed to go back on the uh, sidewalk vendors. Uh, one of the big points I didn't make was, I, I firmly believe we need to have the uh, the, the insurance requirement um, put into um, into what uh, ordinance comes forward. Do we have other comments, uh, Councilmember Holstage? Thank you. So I can also count, and I hear that there aren't three um, for the. Ex nor, you know, I think standardizing the food truck ordinance to be similar to street vending and where other food is allowed. It's no secret that I've been supporting and asking for the city to stop banning food trucks since I was elected in 2017. Um, it's just an important thing for our brand. And I understand that our restaurants are concerned about losing business, but again, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and it's different customers who are going to food trucks than are sitting down for a sit down restaurant. Um, I personally joined Twitter in 2011 to follow food trucks around New York City when I lived there in law school. And um, it's it's an important, it's a cultural part and people have them for, rest, for their parties at homes. And I always just think about, um, I met a entrepreneur, a young woman um, in her late twenties who wanted to start up a coffee business. She was working at Ernest. Um, she had her own idea for a business and she wanted to do a food truck, a mobile uh, coffee shop. And she told me, I can't start my business in Palm Springs because Palm Springs bans food trucks um, and I can't do it. And she actually went to the high desert and did it there. Um, there's other places like Joshua Tree. Um, I'm going to mess up their name. They have a Coachella Valley local coffee company. I hired them for an event I did at my house um, where they had a mobile these things are very Instagrammable, like it's very um, cool and helps with our brand. So um, I hate to see uh, Palm Springs keep the limits that we have. I thought that what the staff brought forward was really reasonable um, just to standardize them um, because these are up and coming businesses that then become brick and mortar. Um, and they're local people. I mean, this understanding that people are um, not local, it's just think of all the opportunity in our own local residents are missing out on who can't start these businesses because of government regulation. I think it's really um, sad about the opportunity that's lost. So, um, you know, I would like to, we have worked with businesses. I did talk to Jerry Keller who called me and um, Dean Levine and other restaurateurs about food trucks. It sounded like to me most of the restaurants didn't support an actual ban or actually did support expansion to other areas of the city to allow for, you know, as long as they're not in front of restaurants, but to allow for food truck events, to allow for them in their parks, um, to allow for them on roads where there aren't restaurants or other parts of town. Um, I heard that support from restaurateurs. So maybe we can um, work with businesses to have a more My comprehensive co conversation about those, the current limits and what could be expanded. In my conversation, it's they, they, it's, they actually seemed all fine with having them in parks or around office parks in particular. And that's probably where a food truck would really want to be yeah. and if we have an event. And, and that, I mean, I don't know. I know there's a couple that have concessions, but I, I think that is fine. And, you know, the example you gave with somebody starting a coffee who worked at Ernest, no, they should not be, you know, right behind Ernest selling coffee and can, you know, taking their customer, uh, that is not great for our, for our city. But 
in Ruth Hardy Park or Duluth, if we could have more, or if we could have them around City Hall. I, I, I my office is on, you know, in an office park on near Farrell and Tamarisk, and there is nothing to eat near there. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy for a food truck. I should say that we do allow more events that have food trucks, and they can fall under the guidelines easier, and they can, you know, they can talk to Village Fest, or I'm sure they could talk, you know, other types of events. So. Thank you. Uh, I, again, I would hope that uh, we are engaging with our restaurant and business community when it comes to food trucks. Unfortunately, when it comes to sidewalk vending, the state of California gave us no option uh, to engage with uh, our local business community. I would also hope that we uh, do not have two sets of rules, one for uh, food trucks that is diminished and smaller than the requirements that we impose upon our brick and mortar uh, restaurants. Thank you. Uh, I would say, is there a motion in terms of sidewalk vending? Well, we have an ordinance in front of us and we've had a listing of issues that we agree upon uh, so the question is, is there is there a motion that could be crafted? If not, then it can come back to us at another time. Um, Mayor Pro Tem? I, I would suggest that it, there was a lot of discussion here okay. today, and I think a motion would be almost impossible with 50 okay. different ca caveats to, to come back with something else and let us get some more review in. I mean, I think this this, I can see... This version compared to the last one came you know, a very long way, and um, you know, we and I. This is where I do agree with, with Councilmember Middleton on this. We don't want to mess this up and then regret it. We want to do it properly and hope you know, given that we have to, and let's 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 see what we can do. And I I suspect that the whole state will end up revisiting this at a certain point anyway, because new things will arise. But I don't think we're ready to make a motion, is my view. Okay. Councilmember Holstage. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's why I was trying to summarize, mm -hmm. because obviously we have to give staff direction, and each of us went and gave individual points or questions, but we didn't summarize what a majority might support. So um, I tried to do that with some of the things. That's obviously not all the items. Does staff feel like they have what they need from us, or should we do that more thoroughly? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have enough. There's still going to be a couple of points, I think, where we'll be uncertain. Um, but I think we have enough to bring you back a, a revised version based on the comments that you've given here this evening. We may also ask for individual input of council members where some things might have been unclear. Uh, and so that way we can come better prepared the next time we come forward. What I would also recommend is that uh, I'm going to probably wait until I have a good draft from the health district on their proposed regulations because that will also help inform how we craft our ordinance and some of the language that we have there. Great. Thank you very much. So then <laughs> Councilmember Holstich, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to use a personal privilege as a mother right now to brag about one of our residents because we have Juan Espinosa in the room who went to Palm Springs schools and um, is from Palm Springs and was raised here and is currently an Equal Justice Fellow with Public Council. Um, and many people might not know, but Equal Justice Works is um, the very, very top legal fellowship that you can get in the country. He just graduated Harvard Law School, um, also the top law school in the country. I went to Stanford number three, he went to number two, <laughs> and I also applied for an Equal Justice Fellowship and did not get it. Um, so from someone who applied for that and knows how hard it is, um, I just really want to applaud him. Amazing that we have the kind of talent that we have um, in this city um, doing this work. So thank you to you and Public Council for um, working with us on this issue, um, and thank you um, to um, the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice who's also been doing really hard work um, working with street vendors directly. So thank you to the nonprofits who are here volunteering their time, who don't get paid to be here, who are advocating for good public policy. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you to everyone involved in this. This I knew this would be our, our longest item. So with that, we are going to head right into our public comment. So this 
time is set aside for members of the public to address city council on non-agenda items. These are general items of general interest that are within the subject, juris subject matter jurisdiction of the city. And while the city council values your opinions and your comments pursuant to the Brown Act, we will not be able to take any action on those items this evening. The first person we have is Michael Joseph Pitkin, followed by Adrian Alcantar. Michael Joseph Pitkin, Chief Joseph said, I will fight no more forever. This was not a statement of surrender. Rather, he led the Nez Perce Nation to survive and see the future. Today, bound equals unbound. I ask for my survival as an advocating gay male for the value of all masculinity within the matriarchy. There is a sacred bond and necessary brotherhood that males contribute between ourselves and to the world. The matriarchy can't expect others to be diverse unless the matriarchy itself is equitably fair. Send a message to the religions of the patriarchy that caringly matriarchy is diverse and equally accepting of males. I ask for my survival as an advocating two-spirit gay male and for the value of all femininity within the patriarchy. Patriarchy show that it accepts the challenge and is equally accepting of females. There is a sacred bond and necessary sisterhood that females contribute between ourselves and to the world. No indentured servitude, no debtors, no human trafficking, no torture, no slavery. God does not special rights or give special rights of the earth to any one people. We are all descendants of the indigenous. Wherever you are, God and of all is everywhere. God said, I am. God does not care who you are, for God said, who am? Hell matriarchy, hell patriarchy, hell the Islamic state of Palestine, hell the Jewish state of Israel, hell theastic Satanist, so it is publicly written, so it is sealed by the blood of the heart, so it shall be existence, emancipation, equality, freedom to be unbound, unbroken forever. Thank you. Next comment is from Adrian Alcantar and then followed by uh, Kendall Kaluit. Good evening, Council. My name is Adrian Alcantar. I'm a business owner at 1717 East Vistachino Road, um, residing in District 2. Um, tonight, I am here to speak on an incident that occurred earlier this evening at 621, um, where I had two vagrants um, try to gain access into my business with an employee locked inside. It took the police department um, one hour and two minutes to respond, um, finalizing the call at 723. Um, they were not there when the employee exited the building tonight. Um, we had to have somebody privately go to the building um, and escort this person out. We talked about safety being our number one priority with businesses um, tonight and making businesses a priority. Obviously, in this case, it was not. The 911 call goes into um, service, you would think you would have an adequate response time. I know that that response time from the police department to my business is a minute and 47 seconds. I've been over 47 calls in the last three months to my business in regards to vagrancy and aggressive behavior with vagrants. I challenge this um, dais to um, really take a look at um, Operation Relentless Sun and how it um, is moving these vagrants from certain areas of town to others as we are flooding the vagrants into not only shopping centers where our residents um, you know, go grocery shopping, but also into their homes. Um, and I would challenge Chief Mills to do a better job. Next comment is from Kendall Cowlett. Good evening, City Council. My name is Kendall Kay. I was the employee that was in that business tonight. I feared that the worst was going to happen. I have never been so discouraged and disappointed by the Palm Springs Police Department in the 19 years that I've lived here until tonight when I felt, oh my God, what could possibly happen to me? I was told by the police officer that I eventually did reach contact with an hour and some minutes later in the parking lot of the AMPM who told me there are only three police officers on tonight. 
Really? Three police officers for a city of this size. That's the best that we have. That's the best that we can do. You talked about brand. Isn't the brand of Palm Springs safety, security? I didn't feel any of that tonight. I felt horrified. I felt scared. I even felt trapped. If it wasn't for the three men that my boss called from the gym to come over and escort me out of there, I don't know what could have possibly happened. But I'm just fearful that this is the best that we have from the Palm Springs Police Department, dealing with these homeless and these vagrants who have nothing to lose by attacking me when I leave my business or attacking an old woman coming out of Stater Brothers or attacking anybody in this town. What are we supposed to do when we call the police department and they tell me I was not a priority? I felt I was a priority. Am I not a priority? Do I not have to rely on the police department? Who, who are we supposed to call? What are we supposed to do? I do challenge this whole city council to figure out what do we do about this craziness that's going on in this town? This town is not safe and secure, and it hasn't been for a long time. We are finding out that there are more and more homeless people that are coming here, that aren't even from here. How are they coming here? Who's moving them here? Why is this happening now? And that's the best that I got. Like I said, disappointed and discouraged by the Palm Springs Police Department. Thank you for your comments. The next comment is on the phone from Jim Sullivan. Jim, are you there? He's on. I don't know if he's having a problem with this audio. Hello, can you hear me? There yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. I'm sorry. Apologies. Um, my name is Jim Sullivan. This is regarding the Palm Springs Swim Center. I'm asking your help to eliminate the morning reservation requirement from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Monday through Saturday. Um, the only reason this reservation system was put in place was during COVID to allow people to swim. And now that we are truly out of COVID for the most part, um, the city of Palm Springs has opted to keep it in place. Yvonne Wise posted a survey on the city's website in December asking residents if they still wanted to have a reservation in place in the morning. And according to the survey, the answer was yes. For the council that may not know the requirement, you have to make the reservation the day before you swim and slots open at 5.30 a.m. If you don't get on the website by 6.30 a.m., the majority of the slots are gone for the next day. This is a public pool primarily funded by me and the other residents of Palm Springs. The reservation system discriminates against people like me who work full time and I cannot get on a website every day just to try to make a reservation to swim. My days are different every day. Sometimes I want to swim at 7 a.m. Sometimes it's at 9 a.m. Sometimes it's at 8 a.m. And it's not fair to me and a lot of the other residents that live here. There are too many days when I have had a reservation and I show up at the pool and there are four to eight lanes that are, um, there are no shows where people don't even show up. When this happens, it blocks other people from swimming and it also reduces the amount of revenue that the swim center is receiving. This pool is almost 50 years old and has never required a reservation up until COVID. No other Coachella Valley pool, including Palm Desert requires a reservation or anything in LA County. It's time that the pool, this huge public asset to the city of Palm Springs goes back to the residents and visitors and that no reservation is required in the morning. This isn't a private pool um, for certain people. It should be open to everyone right now. And again, I'm asking your help to please do away with the reservation from 7 to 7 a.m. To, to 10 a.m., please. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, at this time, we will end public comment and move on to city council and city manager requests and upcoming agenda development. Um, do we have anything from the city manager? 
Uh, yes, uh, Madam Mayor, members of uh, the council, I don't know if they put this uh, up on the screen or not. Uh, there you go. But we, yeah, there we go. We're looking at uh, our next March 23rd regular agenda. I, I did want to mention uh, on April 3rd, we are going to be doing our visioning, uh, visioning ses session. And I have had some comments uh, that you know, if possible, if we could manage our agenda on March 23rd a little bit to not have it so long as we get ready for this uh, August 3rd visioning session. So we'll keep an eye on that. Obviously, things that have to come before you will be before you, but we're trying to manage both, uh, both meetings together. But as you can see on the 23rd, at least for now, we've got uh, the historic designation item public hearing for 1177 East Mesquite. And then we have our community development block grant annual action plan and budget public hearing that we need uh, to be presented to you. And then it looks like a business and legislative policy report to you on um, environmentally preferable purchasing. Uh, guidelines so we have those things right now thank you are there any other items that could potentially come before us at that meeting there often are things that still may come up in the next two weeks that will be added um, and I, I see my colleague uh, we may have a discussion on orchid tree again. We're still in the process of looking at whether or not that will be ready to go forward. And is it possible, um, because it, we this is a, and I don't mean to pack all of our meetings by any means, but we did have a request uh, for a presentation from the fire department, and it seems like this might be a good meeting to do that since there aren't as many items as usual. So I just want to, you know, raise up if there's things like that that this might be a good time for. Uh, yes, Mayor, I can certainly talk to the uh, fire chief and, and talk to him about, uh, I assume it's a general update on the uh, state of the fire department. It, it was on this, the staffing ratios. I think um, Teresa, this was, just, this was discussed at one of our earlier meetings oh. this year. Um, it's regarding the ISO rating, so they wanted to have an understanding of how that... Uh, As it affects insurance rates and things. Correct. Right. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't need to be a long presentation no, by any means. This was raised by Councilmember DeHart earlier this year. We'll certainly follow up with him okay. on that item. Thank you. And then, um, uh, City Attorney Ballinger, I know you had a item you wanted to raise? Yes, I think after the last council meeting uh, discussion about Picasso, there was some question by some of the council members as to whether direction was given. Our office is interpreting the, the council action that direction was given to bring back an ordinance with a regulatory approach. So we plan on doing that. If that's not the case, um, if a majority of the council can let me know, I can re-agendize it and we can kind of put the brakes on that. But otherwise, we plan on proceeding with that type of ordinance probably in the next couple months. Do we have support by majority of council to bring that item forward? Yes. I'm seeing two, I'm seeing three. Okay, okay. No, thank, thank you, you very much. No. Nope. Yeah, we, okay. <laughs> we go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, okay, so I guess it's coming back, but I, I have a question on the, um, the vacation rental updates in April. Is there a general idea of what, what that's covering? Is that covering my specific request? Yes, Mayor, members of council. So the vacation rental item would be in regard to um, the council had requested um, us to gather information on the single family residential units within neighborhoods without apartments and condominiums in it. So we have been working on gathering that data. So it would be an update on that, those densities to the percentage in a neighborhood, as well as exceptions that have been requested um, we can let you know the, the nature of different exceptions that have been requested if council wants to make any policy decisions in regard to those. Um, I had also brought up about a percentage of vacation rental TOT towards housing program. And that also is being worked on and slated for, I believe, an April meeting. And we have learned that that um, can be retroactive to dates to a, a certain date, if indeed the council moves forward with such a, a policy. Okay, it might be a good idea to, ha if it's possible, to do it the same meeting as other 
vacation rental issues, but I'm not sure what's on that. So, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And just for the record, since there were nods, um, for the Picasso ordinance, I did see a yes for bringing it back from council members to Hart, Holstage, and Middleton. And so that's just because they nodded, I wanna just speak it <laughs> into the record. Um, okay, I do have a request. Um, the Sierra Club reached out to me. They may have reached out to other council members. The, the Sierra Club is working with other stakeholders on uh, requesting an expansion of Joshua Tree National Park. It's not a, a huge expansion in comparison to the rest of the park, but they are working on that and as well as creating a state monument that would be ex uh, over in the East Valley. And they're looking for letters of support. They have a letter that they've already drafted and other cities have used. And this would be an item that could come to our consent calendar. Um, so is there interest um, from council in uh, possibly doing that? Yes. Yes, from, go, Mayor, go ahead, Mayor Patron. Uh, this actually came up at the uh, Visit Greater Palm Springs JPA meeting I think it was last month, that the cities of Indio and, um, and Desert Hot Springs uh, wanted to have the JPA do a letter of support. And the other cities had some questions that they were discussing, but this is gonna come back, I believe, at the next meeting on March 31st. So it would be good if we had some kind of a consensus on whether we wanna vote to support that or not. I don't know if that's how that would work. So if our next, oops, our next council meeting is after that date, is what you're saying. Or no, it's before that date. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if, if there's interest from council to see that item, it, it doesn't have to be on consent. It could be a standalone, but it is just a letter, um, and it could be pulled from consent calendar for further discussion. Um, if, if no, if there was some disagreement, but is there support for putting it on the agenda at all? I'm saying yes from council member Holstage. I think there is support for, I, I, it would definitely be helpful to have, okay. to understand where we are because it will, you know, rather than going to the meeting and not having an answer, this was a specific direction right. to come back on March 31st. Okay. Now they may, they may not actually do it, but that was at the last meeting. Okay, so, so then we'll go ahead and prepare an item for your agenda yes, on please. the twenty third. We're, we're seeing a third with um, Mayor Pro Tem yes, and yes, myself. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Sorry. And and yeah, if we if we can put that on consent, that way, if there isn't any issue, it's great. And if there is weak, someone can pull it. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Go ahead, Councilmember DeHart. A couple items uh, for the agenda. Um, you know, we received public comment and concern about uh, four or five. Um, uh, po uh, Arts Commission programs that have been um, uh, long in getting approved from council. Um, I'd like to see those outstanding um, Public Arts Commission items uh, on March 23 so we can give approval and let them move forward on those programs. Um, I, I recall it's, it's five or six, I think, was listed in the communication to us. Um, if, if I might, just Mayor and members of council, uh, typically for the 23rd, our agenda staff reports were, were due this week. Just want to, is it, how, how time sensitive is it for the 23rd to be on the 23rd's council agenda? I, there, the key feedback we got uh, this week was that uh, their uh, one event is pending only a week away or 10 days away. Um, oh, their and, events. And other other program that they've approved funding um, is waiting on council's approval. Um, we'll verify with Mr. Verada, and uh, we'll bring what we can forward to you on the twenty third. Yeah. Okay. And then the fire presentation. You know, I, I brought that up on December fifteenth, and my my intention was just to give. Uh, 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 notice to the community. It doesn't have to come before council. It can be a, a, a Amy Blaisdale item that is posted on our social media, uh, press release, um, just to inform the community of what uh, what the overall issue is. So I don't necessarily need to see it come back in front of council, um, but getting the information out to the community is what um, what I was after. Thank you for that clarification and that did have, that is on our list of uh, support from council. 
Councilmember Holstich. Thank you. Um, thank you to the public commenters who came and spoke. Because of the Brown Act, we're typically not allowed to respond to you, even though you raised really important issues. Um, but our staff is able to respond to you, and you know they'll be around. Um, you can also contact City Hall to get a direct answer. And our police department and our police chief um, have been really responsive um, to requests and uh, for information and. Um, all of that, so happy to work with you on that. Um, I did want to flag, for, not that they're of equal importance because we heard an incident tonight, but I've, re I've also had the concern about the reservation system and ha us having adopted these COVID policies um, that we still are allowing now. Um, I also agree that the that a system that requires reservations is overly burdensome for many people who might not have internet access, people like me who don't wake up at 5 a.m. and will never ever sign up to go to the pool, but might be able to go in person, right? There's a million reasons why. So um, I would love for staff to consider. I know city council, we actually had litigated like some, some of those issues when we did the COVID rules. We spent a lot of time with the community. So I'd hate to see those. That's probably can be addressed at the staff level, but I just wanted to lift that up as something I'm concerned about too. Um, and just so mayor and council are aware, we also do have a drop in times, but I understand. So getting Thank information you for the to the community would be helpful about that. Um, I have a request, though. So I've asked a few different people, but um, our state and federal budget requests to our assembly member and to our congressman and to <coughs> elected representatives, um, if the city is working on our state and federal budget asks with our consultants and if we have a plan of moving those forward within the budget timeline, especially for the state. Uh, yeah. Yes, Council, Council Member, we did see, I saw a number of those emails myself today, and uh, we spoke about uh, getting our, with our consultants at, at Townsend, I believe, yes. who will work with us both at the state and the federal level on those. I saw, it, yes. I saw them come through uh, in both locations, so we'll look at that in conjunction with our legislative policy that's in place, our capital improvement plan that we have. I know we were looking at some bigger projects, some smaller projects. We'll see where they fit in. Thank you, that'd be great. I know some of those are time sensitive. Um, so if we can bring this forward. I do agree that the March 23rd meeting is very light. Um, and so hopefully if another item or two will be added so we can, because the historic designation, the CDBG doesn't take very long. We already even saw CDBG once. So um, we'd love to add some more meat to that meeting. And yeah, would love to get some requests in to our elected representatives, especially some of these have deadlines. Last year, we were successful in getting state funding for the library and for the uh, Plaza Theater. We worked with the Lieutenant Governor mm -hmm. on some of those requests. So that's gonna take time to get going. If you could work on that quickly, thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I, I do, before we adjourn, want to thank Teresa Galvan for all of her work as our interim city manager. Um, you know, Teresa stepped into this role and handled it very well, um, despite having no interest in being the city manager forever. And I, and I think that's a, a big deal, right, to still be the city manager for, you know, what was it, six months? Yeah, six whole months. Um, so I, I know we're all very excited to have Scott here. And we just thank you so much, Teresa, for, for filling those shoes in the interim and, and making sure that everything ran smoothly. We really appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I enjoyed the opportunity and learned a great deal. So um, thanks to my colleagues. Thanks to the support of the council. Um, and we're very glad Scott's here, as you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. I just wanted to add two things. One is that the city announced our big birthday party on April 8th. Um, so that looks very exciting. Um, and also I attended the Plaza Theater board meeting and they did recently announce another million dollar donation from Oakview Group, a charitable donation. And so they are hoping to raise their last two, two point something million by June when they will close for um, for renovation, so and they have some exciting things planned for the next few months to uh, let people know how they can participate and what's going on. So thank you. Thank Mayor. you, and I didn't mean to stop any other comments. Did we have other comments? No, okay.
Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, Scott, to your first Palm Springs meeting. <laughs> and at 9.52 p.m., I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.